So today is January 30th, 2022, and this is our Western Desiderata meeting. And uh, are there any uh, topics uh, anyone want to discuss from the agenda? Uh, anything? Unless anybody wants to break the agenda, I wanted to go through them from top to bottom because we got, um, the, we got a few questions. I just posted one on a long thing on on Reddit, um, which is really interesting and I feel I should address, um, but it's kind of demanding. And um, yeah, uh, the, the questions, I went through at least one of them this morning. Uh, the top one is why why they're probably doing all this, why they're starting to come out with all the u ufology and stuff now. Um, so yeah, it's really this whole thing about ufology is kind of uncorked a genie. But I think there's a lot of people who have like repressed interest and thoughts about it, and it's kind of to do subject. So I think there's kind of a latent demand for this, and I, I think the public is is kind of ripe for it. I get a strong sense. So so I think we should go into it and try and be reductionist and reasonable about the woo. I'll try to give you some guidance on how to. You navigate the dark arts of the woo. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it is an opportunity to go this. But so, yeah, well, uh, let's just go through what these these questions on the ufology. Um, they do fold into the manifesto in a funny kind of way. Um, is it uh, so? I think I'll answer the first one. Is it to psychologically prepare the masses for a transition? Um, or for the cataclysm uh, that the flipping climate disruption uh, will bring. Um, are they trying to elevate us all to their level? Yeah, I mean, it, it looks like that. I mean, it, lo it looks like they are trying. You see, again, this is not a homogeneous block. These are all factions. So, yeah, there's, there's one faction that's trying to bring us up to date, I think, um, because they the party that think we're in going into an interplanetary war and they want everybody prepared for it. Um, then I think there's another group that thinks we're going into a great interplanetary peace and, you know, enlightenment for the, you know, as we discover we're not alone in the universe and there's that kind of crowd. So it's kind of like, yeah, all, it's a bit of all these things really. Um, and none of them are really good in my view because if my theory is correct, then they're going through into this with all with a lack of knowledge. Um, so, yeah, so they, in other words, they don't know what they're looking at. It's a bit of sources or pentas. So when, when we went through last Sunday in the Eastern meeting, I was kind of explaining to you about how it works with feedback and how you can auto suggest and use somebody's powers with, you know, the theory that everybody has these powers you just have to unlock them and take the brakes off and, and kind of and gary kind of spotted me doing the same thing to you <laughs> which, is, which is correct uh, what i'm doing is is taking the brakes off so the the brakes so just think of them as kind of like a cop i always mention the cop and you know in the 60s and all, all of when these guys got into all the woo in the 60s timothy Le leary and the lsd and ken kesey and all of those guys it was they often said, you know, we have to get rid of the cop inside us. You know, it was all the hippies against the cops in the summer of love. And they were like, we, we just want peace and love and dandelions. And then the cops are muzzling in with the bad energy and stuff. And it's, uh, it's what they, I think what they were saying was what I'm trying to describe is that it gets into a feedback loop. But there's just like there's one side of us that wants to get into the peace and love and the feedback loop. There's also a cop in us that's desperately trying to stop this and pull a halt to it. And so there are these two competing factions. And I think they literally in, our, in each side of the brain. So, you know, the, the 
peace and love thing, I really just, just if you go by my five layered brain theory, then it's just the mammalian brain, the older brain layer. It's all the four other layers competing with the alien cortex. The alien cortex is the cop. And it, it it's kind of the reason why the cops muscle in, why you have like Kent State where the cops opening up on poor students and all this insanity is they, the, they kind of want to be invited to the party, uh, but the alien cortex is not invited to this party and it knows it. It's not invited into paradise. It's kind of like Moses, uh, you know, can't, can't get to the land of milk and honey. He, he can lead everybody there, but he's he's not actually eligible to enter. And it's kind of like that for the alien cortex. It has to stay behind for the simple reason that it's a shit. If you admit the alien cortex into paradise, it's not paradise anymore. <laughs> It's like it's like assholes are excluded because otherwise this club is not not paradise, and so it's it, it's but you see, the alien cortex knows this and desperately wants to be invited into the peace and love. I mean, I think all the cops that you know shot students in in uh, Kent State, I think it's kind of out of a fit of jealousy. Is like they're not invited to the party. Is a lot of the stuff that's going on there. And uh, it was reinforced. The students kind of reinforced this dynamic because I think, you know, a lot of the female ones, um, they came and kissed the cops on the mouth and put daisies in their guns, which is all erotic, consensual. And it's, you know, they thought, you know, make love, not war and stuff. But it's, you know, they unleashing all these psychoerotic powers that are very powerful and they don't understand. <laughs> so, so it was a dangerous time and everybody felt it. That's why 1968 was so big, but it's, it's kind of the price of passage so that you can get these kind of enlightenments, like the, you know, the picture of Earthrise from Apollo eight, which I, I'd say is that was what the Apollo program was for. They didn't know it, but looking back, the only thing we got out of the, the Apollo program was the major psychic nectar that we pulled out of that whole expensive, almost suicidal gambit was that picture of Earth. We rediscovered Earth and the blue dot and all that stuff. And so it's like the price of that picture is, is a lot. I mean, it's a large part of the national defense in terms of raw money and in terms of psychic energy. It's came very close to annihilating, you know, humans and, and this Cuban missile crisis and stuff. And they all related. So the price of this advance is heavy. Um, and so I tried to say in this morning's meeting that, okay, you, you can't get too woo on this. It's like I was making a case for saying that you can't violate the laws of physics. I've seen incredible woo stuff, right? I've never seen the law of physics book. <laughs> Yeah, what I conclude is people don't understand the laws of physics. That I'm absolutely convinced of. They they don't they're confusing a lot of things. They're confusing geophysical events and psychic events and stuff. And it's very hard to tease apart. And so, well, hard. It's time consuming. And so we're under the clock. We're trying trying to get to the the flippening or the rapture or Armageddon or whatever you choose to point. You know, the enlightenment. Uh, it's a RT or whatever. It's the big, the big change, psychic, physical, and everything. We're trying to get to it under the gun uh, with a stopwatch. You know, it's like so. You've got to make sure you don't get waylaid in any of these things. But you can't just ignore everything and run ahead. You have to basically give everything its due. So, it, kind of like the sh shamanic journey that they must have been taking people on in caves and and stuff i think the guys in the caves are a bit fraudulent they're starting to use an entheogens and shortcuts and using the the pictures on the shobi cave and stuff they're just marvelous things but they seem to be aids uh, to instruct people on how to negotiate the afterlife so it's you know like i mentioned you the, the instruction must have gone like something like, oh, and then you meet the elk spirit and the elk spirit will challenge you in this way and then you must reply this and prove that and use this amulet and this spell and stuff. And, then, and so, uh, you know, I think that a genuine shaman would have told people that and it would have been a psychic journey done, you know, on a prayer cushion. But I think the guys in the, the caves, they're starting to cheat. They're becoming priests. They're making 
churches and then they kind of a giveaway is what i said in the cave of lionesses that's a little bit off right there the the shame and raping a lion it's like mm, something's gone desperately wrong um and then by the time you get to go back to Itapi and stuff it's yeah it seems to me that you know there's money involved there's a priestly class you see you know it's the, the early vatican the proto-vatican there it's turning into religion and it's getting seriously unsavory and uh, by the way, I mean, I think they're definitely eating people, right? So, okay, so I must feel I must tell you this. It's probably more information than you want, but you're going to have to hear it. So, the um, in in essence, you know, the, uh, cannibalism <laughs> goes right through this uh, this thing, and you know, in Christianity, I, I posted something there, which I'm. Let's not get too deeply into Christianity because it's a little off the woo path, but let's start from the point of view of energy. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so uh, is like, is is everybody muted on the camera or is it just me and the bandwidth? Because I, I can't see anybody. Is there anybody there? No, I'm there. If you can see me, I'm still on the camera. Yeah, me too. Oh, okay, so, yeah, my bandwidth must be low because... Um, people start using the cell phone network on a Sunday evening, and so they choose up the bandwidth. And I don't think the 4G cell here, as very appropriate cell, has a has has a bandwidth. So it starts to bandwidth limit me, and then I can't see anybody. So it's uh, well, that's very appropriate. Yeah, as long as you're still there, and I'm not talking to the the wind. <laughs> that's very so, appropriate because if you were starting to talk about energy, like. Like Gary was suggesting yes. this morning, you might yes, get back is. to that because it's very interesting, yes. the parallel and uh, what's happening there too. Uh, yes. Okay, so now this is where we got to in the early morning thing. And then Gary asked these questions about energy and uh, stuff. And I mentioned like Rothko's picture and Gary asked it, sent a few emails afterwards about, about that. And I said, you know, what yeah, Gary was thinking in terms of the the picture has energy in it. They, yeah, it does. If you put a match to it, it'll give you a few kilojoules. You can warm your hands around a fire by burning the canvas and frame. But that really is about as much energy as it's got. And so I said, um, well, I, oh, no, Sophie, it was your question, wasn't it? No, no, it was Gary. And he also, oh. because he started by talking about all the, all the energy with the posts on Reddit. And then he brought, he came up with the word portal. And then you said, oh, oh, and we're going to leave that for this evening. So that's where we left it, really. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See, okay, so so what, what I said afterwards is that what I wanted to introduce to you is this kind of concept that, again, it takes a lot of teasing out because we made such a train wreck of this in the 20th century. All these icons and famous people, especially people like Shannon, Feynman, Marie Gell-Mann, and the cyberneticist, Turing, and all these guys, and, and particularly Einstein, put us in a ditch because they confused all of the stuff. They confused information and entropy and stuff. And so, so, um, so I think I'll introduce it this way and see if it works. But think of it something like this. It's information energy. There's not that concept of a unified concept of information and energy. There's uh, information and entropy, which was a huge mistake, because they started talking about information and entropy, and that's like uncompressibility of information, and confusing it with Boltzmann's thermodynamics. Is, is Ryan on this call? Okay, that's a pity, because Ryan could keep me straight here. But... Uh, but the um, so this concept of entropy, which has got to do with ideal gases and molecules bumping into each other, uh, 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 got you know transported into information theory, and now everybody talks about information entropy. And Shannon said, "Well, that's incompressibility, and if you have redundancy, that's not information. It's just the bits that you can't compress, and not, and all of this crap." So eventually, you get to the point where it's just bullshit. I, actually, somebody said, I can't remember who said it now, but man, that is a that is the best quote in physics. And he said that he said the quote. I can't remember who it was, but it was 
I don't know. He was a smart guy. And he, he said that um, more bullshit has been spoken about entropy than any other subject. And I'd say, hurrah. <laughs> Finally, so and just to give you an extent of how much bullshit is peddled with entropy and information entropy and science. And basically, this is we're talking in, right at the heart of this religion, because part of physics, they got to the point where they said everything is information. And then you got we learn something. He said it for bit. So it means he said, you know, everything is digital. This stuff, by the way, comes from Leibniz, from Leibniz doing zeros and ones and a bit of the stuff that I said. So it's kind of Leibniz was doing this kind of theological numerology on with, with binary things, zero, and it was all because he was studying the I Ching and stuff like that. So but I I've, I went over that a bit before. But anyway, you fast forward to the modern age, and then they're talking about you know, in the 60s about it's all information all of physics and then then you quickly get to and it's a simulation it's all a big computer simulation all horseshit like this and then but to give you an ex an idea of the extent of how badly off the road i mean i you can you can easily find articles in nature i've seen articles in nature where these are peer-reviewed articles basically if you get a paper in nature you pretty much made your career and i've seen papers in nature there's like they're bullshit from stem to stern and uh, give you the level of the bullshit is that you know kind of this uh saw one where this guy was hypothesizing that when if you clear all your hard drive on the computer then you clear all the bits to zero and then for you'd be lowering the temperature of the computer and then it was like all this utter crap and confusion of thermodynamic temperature and information entropy and it, it and it must have been reviewed by at least three or four reviewers in, in the field <laughs> in information tech, science or something you know, like that. And I'm just appalled that it made it through the review process. But I'll give you an idea why it's so stupid. Because in, if, you, if the guys knew a bit more about electronics, from most, if not all, electronics is architected so that a zero is actually where the current flows through the transistor. So, and a one is no current flow, which is, you know, everybody thinks it's the opposite because there's a little zero and one on the, you know, on the little button on the computer and zero means off and one means on. And information theorists are taught that. And they don't know that, yeah, it's badly architected if you actually do that in silicon. So what a lot of CPUs and GPUs and stuff, they, they're actually the opposite. So what this fool had said was, if, if you basically zero out all the all the zeros say in stock in a solid state disk then the computer will get get cooler and it would actually heat up because there's more current flowing through it's just like a heater right so so it's, he's saying like if you switch on more bars on on your bar heater it'll cool down because they're more offs than on it's like this is absolute horseshit and it's peer-reviewed and published in Nature so that it can confuse another 10,000 graduate students. And so, yeah, it's, so this is the state of how pathetic it is in, in the sciences. But then now this is important because then it, it stops them understanding things like woo. <laughs> if, they're so, if they're so deep down the hole in the conventional understanding, then you haven't got a hope in who. <laughs> So here's the hope in who. So um, try and get you. Now I've done the setup. I've better deliver. And so, okay, let me try this. So try and get your head around this concept. Like Einstein unified space time, try to imagine there's something called unified information energy. Okay, so then, and now think of it even colloquially, like you're saying, uh, this this is a heavy tone. So if, if it has lots of energy, it would have a lot of weight, you know, like Einstein E equals MC squared, which I think is bollocks, but anyway, let's pretend it's okay. Then um, you would say, oh, this is a weighty tone. And now a lot of people would say, yeah, that's a metaphor. If you, if you, you know, say this is Eden, Enid Blyton, it's light, lightweight, light fiction, and this is a weighty tone. And you say, yeah, it's a metaphor. Because, you know, you can read Enid Blyton and, and stuff and you, you really wade through this Principia Mathematica or something. And then you'd say, but if you put them on a scale, they would weigh the same. And say, yeah. But hold that 
court. <laughs> okay. Again, going back to the Rothko picture, when you're saying like, is this, you know, what Gary was saying, is this a capacitor? Does it store electrical charge or energy? I say no. Think of it like a gate. So it's, you know, according to, it needs a viewer, right, as the picture. But somewhere in this concept which I'm trying to float to you is this idea that Rothko, in this picture, any great artist, he's unlocked your own energy. So um, it's very, think of it very much like a valve, right? I was mentioning a valve in a lot of Sunday. And so you have, you know, a meter and a collector. And then you have this drill in front of it or a base, you know, in a transistor. So you just put a tiny, tiny current on the base. And that interrupts the flow from the meter to the collector. Okay, quite an important concept here because it takes a very little in information or energy on the base to interrupt the flow. Okay, so so the energy is being ducted through the circuit through the and from the meter to the collector. Right, it's it's not in the painting, but the painting can unlock all these neurons, all these nexuses, all these competing ideas in your head. Does that make sense? So the energy is coming from you. Now, it's not free. It's not Harry Potter where you can just suck energy out of nothing. It's it really, you you need to eat your Wheaties. <laughs> so in other words, if I get you and put you in a state, an altered state, because you don't have enough food, I can put you in a different state so that when you see Rothko's painting, it'll have a vastly different effect on you. So, so then it's conceivable that, that I show you um, not so much a Rothko painting, but say um, a mandala or a magic hex or something like that. And that hex is designed to unlock a little, what Freud would call his little neurosis in you, it's a blockage in you. It would unlock that and you could do something telekinetic, like move a glass. You can't move the glass and, you know, unless you've got the energy to do it. You, you're taking that out of the breakfast you had this morning. <laughs> so there's it, so what they're missing is they say, oh, no, you can never move the because they don't believe that you could actually have a force at a distance, you know, Einstein, spooky action at a distance. <laughs> like, no, that's woo. You wouldn't have it. <laughs> and so it's like, no, no, you can. It's just, it's, you know, it's field effects and electricity. You, you, you know, so, okay, now, now I think I can get on a little bit to to the question that I posted that I got by email, but I asked if I could just post it on, on Reddit so everybody could see it. But it's, it's, um, it's here. It's, a, it's this guy. I don't, I never heard of him or anything, but anyway, um, he's an English guy who had these theories in parapsychology and um, psychotronics. And so I posted it. Oh, well, I thought I did. Um, and he had this little diagram and, um, and stuff. So, yeah, I think he's on the, the guy, basically the guy's on the right track. Um, he, ha so he had the, a theory that all these psychotronic things, they are regular, quite mundane. Um, damn, I can't find this thing. Anymore. Oh yeah. Albert Budden. There we go. Okay. If you, if you open that, you can see there's this picture and it's called Psychic Close Encounters. And then he's got this, this diagram, which is in a loop. And so it says, you know, at number one, like UAP or um, unidentified aerial phenomena uh, enters the ambient field. So in other words, um, basically a place where they can actually interact, Hilbert space or something like that. And so I think that's right. Uh, but I think one of the things that that Albert here has got wrong is he's thinking that there, there are electromagnetic things. I think he's thinking in terms of, well, there's a lot of electronics around. There's a, a lot of high tension wires, you know, um, cables from the grid. There are a lot of um, radar and microwave towers and now cell phone towers and soon to be you know, 5G towers and stuff. So he's right. Those things are, he's on the right track. He's saying that people often you know, hit by lightning, then become extra sensitive to these things. And he's saying, you know, they become kind of allergic to the electric fields. 
so that um, you know they become hyper responsive to things like microwaves and things. So if you get like Havana syndrome, it's the guys are reacting to probably um, Russian or Cuban um, uh, basically interrogation. They're putting microwaves through the embassies because they they they're trying to. You know, they're using the effects to try and do surveillance, but people are picking them up. Now, they thought, you know, they used to think, well, you know, that doesn't have any effect on humans. Microwaves will go right through. So they say, no, they have chronic effect. And so these people are, are feeling all these effects. And so that's kind of what this Albert guy is thinking. He's, he's right, except there are a few caveats. And the, the reason you know that this doesn't explain everything is because Long before we had this electronic noise everywhere, you can go back in the Bible and the Romans saying, you know, that the armies were followed by fiery shields in the sky, you know, flying saucers and stuff like that. So, so yeah, it's not, it doesn't start with, you know, after the war. These things don't all start, they, they ramp up after the war because of stuff I told you about, like they started unpainting and uncloaking UFOs and stuff. So it definitely ramps up. There are more people as well. The population's growing. So every time the population doubles, you get double the number of sightings and stuff. But it's, uh, you, yes, yeah, so that can be where it initiates from. It can be an interaction between the microwaves and people's psychotronic abilities. Now, um, you have to add in all the effects in nature, like the the, the Heseldon lights and you know the Minmin lights, and well, they geophysical phenomena, and they come from you know, like I said, piezoelectric thing and all this kind of you know deposits of of iron and things in the natural in the earth, as you know, in the core, all this circulating magma, all of these things. We live in a very very electromagnetic universe now. It's funny because NASA and these things, they thoroughly discount electromagnetism. <laughs> much. So there's, there's lots and lots of mysteries in space that are just because NASA and, and cosmologists and that un, underplay electromagnetic phenomena. And it's like, there's a lot of <laughs> electromagnetism going on. So they see all things like funny shapes of asteroids that are, you know, look like a dog's bone in the sky and they can't think of how anything could do that. And they say, yeah, of course, man, the bloody thing's charged. <laughs> and then they finally, you know, they go and do a probe into an asteroid and then poof, and then blinks out. And they go, how did that happen? It's like, because it's like an aircraft. If you don't touch a flying aircraft, you'll get a 50,000 volt static shock from the skin. <laughs> it's like, it's, they, I don't know why they have such blinkers about the electromagnetism in space. Don't forget space is a vacuum. So it's you know the dielectric of air as well. They you can't ignore. It depends on how much you heat there. <laughs> so all, there are all these effects which are just they're completely blind to. So sure, all of those go back in time all the way to Native Americans and all of that stuff. So you you have to say that those are initiated. Now this guy has got the right idea, or at least according to my theory, and that's that. They, they are stimulating people. We also very electric. I mean, the, the human brain has a, a, a lot of charge and electricity. Often the, the flows in it and stuff are, they cancel each other out. They're diametrically opposed. And so, so uh, you know, they're kind of self-defeating. And that's why, you know, you can Put, uh, you can influence somebody. You can get a nine volt battery and stick it here, and then somebody can put a god helmet on. They put a god helmet on. All they do is they stimulate your, they either stimulate your alien cortex, or uh, or otherwise they completely fuck it up. So then it means that your, the other four layers stop being suppressed. So in other words, the way I assume the god helmet works is you just get a, a an oscillating charge here. It really, you know. The brain is at the point of criticality all the time. It's 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 right on the edge of criticality. That's how it functions. So it's easy to push a critical thing, you know, over into one state or another. And so they do, that's what they do. They put a god helmet here, and then it's so the so what the left brain, the right brain is saying is like it's it, it's not being suppressed. They're just suppressing the cop 
they're just disabling the cop, so the cop stops inhibiting inhibiting the right side. As soon as you stop inhibiting the right side, then the right side side says, "Yes, there is a God," and it gets all religious. <laughs> right? What it's saying is that the God that it detects, the, what they say, the presence and all this thing is it's the right hemisphere. It's just is the as soon as you give the 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 I mean the left hemisphere as soon as you give the right hemisphere a break or you take the brakes off then it says you know it starts to reveal itself it says yes uh, it's the reason why most women more women go to church than men and the reason is because they're more dominated by the right hemisphere and the mammalian brain and it's when they go to church it's just the right hemisphere is praying to the left hemisphere it's basically that's as simple as, as it is and so the uh, but it's kind of, there's proof of this i mean i'm not making this shit up if you go and ask like vs ramachandran and and gazanaga and sperry they've done in all these experiments so it, it gives you a hint of what consciousness is it's kind of like this competition between two opposites and so the you know gazanaga and sperry will say vs ramachandran in this they had a conference of uh, called Beyond Belief, and it was all against religion and trying to de-woo religion. And, and Ramachandra did split brain experiments, and so Gazan again, Sperry, and, and they they said, you know, like Christianity and stuff is completely untenable because when they split the corpus callosum on some of these particularly patients like um, epilepsy patients and it's a very drastic operation they don't do it lightly but it's kind of like the person will commit suicide if they don't and so then they cut the corpus callosum and then they for a brief period they get a chance to do all these experiments and see how the right and left actually behave and you know the Gilchrist should be there because he, <laughs> all this thing gets get shown but what what vs ramachandran said is you can communicate to the right hemisphere in other words the left eye and you can say ask it a question it has a bit of language capability really the language capabilities in Wernicke's and brokers area here in your left hemisphere but it has a it has the ability at least to read not much good at speech and vocalization but it, it some people are switched over but they in you know, i'm talking the average person but so you can suggest a question to the right hemisphere and they do this do a little night and they say if you believe in god then you know tap the salt or otherwise tap the pepper you know if you don't believe in god and the, and the right brain will always tap the salt and say yeah i believe in god and then they then they ask verbally because then it goes through the, the the right ear to the left brain they ask they hey do you believe in god no nah, i'm a complete atheist and they say Hello. so ramachandran is saying well they published this in a paper and he said that it should have sent shockwaves around the world the vatican should have had a crisis meeting because you know what are, what are the caliphate and all these imams and that do you say you just you know what is this guy he's, he's supposed to whether you believe in god determines whether you go to heaven or hell for eternity he said, well half this guy's brain is going to heaven and half is going to hell by the look of this and so they laugh but you say don't laugh so fast the guys are right it's just you miss it you made a false assumption of what god is god is here much closer to home than you thought so the left brain is just left brain compartments just playing to the right brain compartment it's you know here's the capital dome here's the dome of the vatican here right here this is your cranial dome this is the freaking dome of the rock it's like it, it, it's all revealed in the language and the metaphor and stuff and then you know when they see they're just expressing their subconscious when they do St. Paul's Cathedral or the Sistine Chapel or the Vatican. And then they, they draw all the pictures of the angels and they're, they're drawing, you know, it's, they can't raise it to the level of consciousness like I'm doing to you now is to making it conscious. And then it's a joke. It's basically they, they're doing the dome and then there's like saying, that's your head. And there are all these little thoughts going around. <laughs> and, so, and there's God in the middle. And so he's like, yeah, the guys are just, your right brain's trying to tell you, oh, yeah, we, the church represents the human body. The dome is your cranial dome. It's not rocket science, guys. It's pretty freaking infantile when you get down to it. So can, I ask you, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? I don't want to interrupt where you are there, but 
I kind of lost track before when you were talking about psychotronics and, and the gates notion, because I was trying to understand certain terms in physics that you were explaining. I see Ryan is, is here now and Bob, hi. Uh, but oh, I mean, I, I was, oh, well, that's uh, a very good thing to I, I was wondering if we could, you couldn't track. go back on that a little bit because it wasn't, yeah, I mean, me honestly, I, I sort of <laughs> so got in the fog yeah, okay, there. So, 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 okay, so now I'm, I'm trying to develop this theme of all this concept in you. So like, let me try to tell you a story that will give you an idea of the sketching's outline of a theory, just like uniform, uniform, like like Einstein unified space and time. So you, you, you know, it's actually okay, Einstein is a big fraud. Okay, it's Minkowski. So Minkowski in uh, unified space and so it's Minkowski space time. And he says Einstein because Einstein is a thief. He's he's a criminal. Einstein is a criminal. He's he's. I mean, a lock you up fraud. He's a lock you up fraud. I mean, literally. He, he, if he was found out, he would have gone to jail for fraud. He's, he's, as far as I can tell, he is a complete charlatan. So I just, well, since I've just thrown it out there, you, I guess I better tell you why, why, why I think that before somebody thinks I'm talking from ego. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sophia, give me a chance to, to, since I broke open the seal of Einstein as a complete fraud, I, I feel I'm going to get flamed by, you know, I've just, I've just touched one of the, I've just shat on the feet of one of the idols of science, if not the biggest idol of science. So you've got to give me a little break here so I can talk to people that see this because a lot of people now have just completely unsubscribed. So I thought Hugh was a bit more intelligent than that, but I could just see now he's an egotistical fuckhead and he thinks he's cleverer than Einstein. Say, no, 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 no. Listen, you don't unsubscribe. Listen first. Okay, give me a break here. I'll tell you why I think Einstein is a complete fraud. In fact, I'm sure of it. Yes, the um, Einstein is is not Einstein. It, it's actually Minerva. It's Minerva. Um, what is the name? Minerva, Minerva Milik. I think that's it. Yeah, but it's his wife. So <laughs> the the proof of this is is that I you see Einstein had his Annus Mirabilis, his miracle year in 1905. Uh, he was really a bastard and he got her pregnant and so he he screwed up but the brains it's it's really a pair at, at the very best it, einstein was you know miller miller, um, miller and einstein together miller, miller was a very very smart serbian woman but he, she's a bit like emmy nota is that the especially the German world was not ready for a female genius. <laughs> and so, um, so to, to get her ideas out, she had to use Einstein, but at the very most, they're kind of like Eloise and Abelard and they're having scientific conversations and that, that lead to, you know, specific and general relativity and all of, you know, all of this stuff. Um, but it's a complete, uh, a complete fraud is, is, you know, if anything, she, she should have got the Nobel Prize. He got it. But here's a bit of a giveaway, um, is that he gave the Nobel Prize money to, to Minerva. And everybody says, well, that's because she was looking after the kids and bloody No, <laughs> that was hush money. Because basically, she knew damn well that Einstein was a thicky, or well, not so much of a thicky, but not, not any more than a patent car, <laughs> not any more than a burn car. And you can see afterwards, afterwards, he goes to Princeton and stuff, and he never does any science that's better than you'd expect from a second class patent <laughs> clerk in Bern. And everybody's confused and they all go like, you know, it's funny how Einstein's later work, he never did anything or came up in the rest of this. <laughs> it's like, like, of course, it's like, don't you get it? It's Miller, it's not him. <laughs> and it, so I tell you how I came to this is because it's it's it was nagging me all the time. I, I read up a lot of Einstein and stuff when, when I was a kid. And it it bugged me that you know everybody's like almost protesting too much that he's such a genius. And I'm just like I'm not seeing this genius that much. When you actually I mean talk when you see his stuff and read his autobiography and stuff like that, you're thinking this guy's not a real super genius here. It's a bit, it's a bit like Darwin and stuff. They, they kind of compensate me for something. And um, 
uh, but the, the key moment for me was really cracked open a huge a huge vista for me and it was kind of life changing for me <laughs> I, I was reading it, it was genuinely confusing because when you read his papers and you read his stuff it's brilliant stuff but then the actual guy i was you know i i read about how zillard came to him and told him about the nuclear bomb and stuff so einstein you know fission and all these neutron smashing protons and chain reactions and stuff it's all comes out of the stuff that Einstein did. And that's why they all celebrate E equals MC squared. But but when I, you know, all the way back to E MC, MC squared, you know, I'm like a schoolboy in physics. And so I'm like, I look at him and go, what a fucking fraud. It should be, I always think, and to this day, I still think that it should be E equals a half MV squared. And you say, why do I say that? Because, because I've only just recently heard about the, you know, the equation for momentum. So what Einstein is doing is he's saying like, oh, everything's particles. So then, you know, he's taking, you know, you know the formula that you learned in school, P equals a half MV squared, mass times velocity squared. And that half has an interesting history. That half, a woman, so nobody eventually, that half in P equals a half MV squared. You know what I'm talking about? Momentum equals mass times velocity squared, right? So there, this it, I can't remember what her name was, but she's another one of these um, prodigies and stuff like Emmy Nota and Ada Lovelace. I can't remember. Um, oh man, I wish I could remember her name. But anyway, she's she came up with the half, and nobody would believe her. Eventually, she proved it by getting cannonballs. She got two cannonballs of different size and dropped them in mud. I think she could say, you know, by the mud displaced, you can see there's a half in the equation. I'm not entirely sure why there is a half, but it definitely is. A, and so when I saw, I saw that Einstein's just stolen that. He just said, oh, well, they're all just marbles flying in through the air. What's their velocity? The speed of light. So, it's, you know, replace V squared with C squared. Great. And then it's mass. That's the same. And then it's P. He's just saying you know, the energy is the momentum of the particles shooting out. And I think, like, doesn't anybody get that this guy's a huge fraud? And like, you know, what are you talking about, kid? This is the biggest genius the planet's ever in. I'm like really confused. But then I started reading about the Solvay conference, and the, so the Solvay conference was uh, in 1927. Einstein was invited to the the Solvay conference basically because of Brenner, I think. Brenner. The only reason you've heard of Einstein is because of uh, Bremer. And Bremer, they respected Bremer, all the, the big shots of the time, and Planck and Bohr and all of these guys. And so, so they, you know, they thought, well, we don't see it. Uh, he looks like a dipshit, dipshit to, to us. But OK, if Bremer sees something brilliant in this guy, let's, uh, let's go for it. I think what they were see, he was seeing was Miniver. Miniver. But, but anyway, Einstein goes to the conference in, in 1927. Now, this is a very epochal part of, the, of science. Um, because after 1927 becomes the, really the birth of the Copenhagen theory of quantum theory and all the quantum weirdness and stuff. So what happened at the, the conference is that Einstein and Bohr got into an argument about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the fact that you can't really extract two bits of information out of a out of a particle. So in other words, you you collapse the wave function. So it's like, uh, you know, you can't. The, the the more you closer you get to finding a particle's position, the less you'll be able to say about the momentum and stuff. And it's it's kind of you know saying, look, everything's billiard balls. You have to use a billiard ball to interrogate a billiard ball. You, you're going to screw up something in what you're trying to interrogate. It's not not a not a brilliantly difficult theory to understand, but it has implications. So Einstein got into these debates with Bohr in the Solvay conference, and he would say he would try and think up these thought experiments to say, no, I can get two bits of information out of a particle or a photon or whatever, and and so um, you know then. They would debate it, and then Bohr would come back with an answer and say, no, you can't. And so the final clincher was 
Einstein thought about it and he, he had a few allies there and stuff. And then he, he came to Bohr in one day in the conference and he said, okay, I've got it. He said, I can get two bits of information out of, out of this thought experiment. He says, imagine you have a box. I've got a photon in it. I open a slot on the box. Uh, no, I weigh the box first. Open a slot on the side, let the photon out, close the slot, wear it again. Now the photon's gone off, way off, being into space. I, it's still fine. I haven't collapsed the wave packet, everything. But now I can weigh the box again, and I'll see the difference. And I've weighed the the um, I've extracted the weight of the the photon without um, without destroying the wave packet. Now I think I read this at like fifteen or something. And I went like, "No, you stupid idiot." You can't open the slot. How do you know when the photon's gone out? And so I thought, what an idiot. And then I read more and I thought like, then heard like Niels Bohr went to sleep and it gave him a sleepless night. He couldn't think of an answer. It took him a whole night. And in the morning, he came back to Einstein and said, no, I've got it. He said, you wouldn't know when the photon had gone out the box. And then uh, he's Danish, not German, but anyway, you get the picture. And the, so the um, uh, and, and and so I said, I was like, "Holy crap!" You mean Niels Bohr took all night to think of that? I just thought of it like that. And then I thought, "Come on, what the hell's wrong?" I said, Einstein can't be that stupid, can he? And I started to realize he is. He's that stupid. And so he's real on and on. You see, stupid, stupid, stupid. So like, so Zillard came to him, told him about the atomic bomb chain reaction and stuff. And he said like, oh, I never thought about a bomb. I never thought you could make a chain reaction. What? <laughs> what are you doing? And then the biographers come and they say, why didn't, didn't, you know, Einstein get the obvious? The Zillard was <laughs> and they said, well, it's because he was such a pacifist. He could never think of a bomb because he was like, oh, come on. And then all this thing about Q, he said his biggest blunder was he, he thought of a static universe. So in a static universe that Einstein described uh, under gravity, then everything just would before. Fly. Oh yeah, go for it, I, Ron. Before you, yeah, but before you move on, um, there's a there's a point. Uh, Einstein also invented lasers, and his uh, design, um, his suggestion for their use was as space weapons. So that's bullshit about saying he couldn't come up with weapons because he was a pacifist. Yeah, I mean, come on, this this big pacifist, the first thing that Zillard does is come through the door and says, you know, I think they're making a big anti-Jewish weapon um, in Germany. And he says, oh, my God, here, I'll write, a, I'll write a letter to Roosevelt saying we've got to start a bomb program. And that's why they started the Manhattan Project, because Einstein sent a letter that scared the shit out of Roosevelt. He said, like, oh, this sounds like a big pacifist, right? He says, like... Dear Mr. Roosevelt, it has come to my attention that these people are doing a super weapon to wipe out the Jews. We need to annihilate them, annihilate them. <laughs> it's like, uh, sounds pretty pacifist to me. It's like, come on, they're making up all this horseshit. So anyway, if you reverse engineer it and you get back, then you suddenly see that the middle is brilliant. And it's all her. It, there is a caveat that, that she after Einstein got her pregnant and stuff, is that uh, her work really deteriorated and she stopped doing any work. Now, the autobiographers say, well, she didn't need to because Einstein was famous and <laughs> all those papers in the Annus Mirabilis she, comes from her. What could have happened is that um, she, she went into a decline having the kids. She went into a psychological decline and Einstein got all... She was ignored. Einstein was brutal to her, taking all the glory. And so uh, that could explain why her, her work deteriorated. But she was, you know, she was much more brilliant than Einstein and the Polytechnic. I think she ended, up, uh, she ended up being diagnosed with schizophrenia, actually. Yeah. Yeah, she had a schizophrenic son with Einstein. But, yeah, that's the brilliance. It's, you see, right on the edge of all the Annus Mirabilis and the papers is, this, this fine line between genius and psychosis, you know, it's this, it's a, like, you don't see it in Einstein, he's kind of a dullard, he doesn't, I can't see any sign of uh, genius or psychosis in Einstein. And so, yeah, so, so 
um, at the very most, I think that the interaction and conversations, they did a bit of magic, you know, between each other. But at the very most, it's it's an equal collaboration. And so then the, by the time he gets, he gets the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. Um, with the with the caveat, no, I think he was given it for general relativity, and if that's ever proved wrong, then the photoelectric effect. I think that's what it was. But he gets a huge purse of money, I mean a fortune, uh, and he gives it all to Minerva. And so it's like, uh, now Einstein was a real shit, and you just just read his letters and stuff. He did not the the things have really gone south when he divorced her. So. So, you know, you, the question hangs is, why did he give it? And it's like, it's obvious. It's such, it's such money. He said, okay, you did all the work. <coughs> you, get the, you get the Nobel Prize, <coughs> all the money. I keep the recognition. And, of course, that's the settlement. He said, I get to be the genius. I get to be the face of genius on all the mugs and sold to all the kids as the genius. So, you know, you give me that and then... You don't get the recognition. I would take that. You get the money. And obviously she went, fuck it, Alberto. Fuck you and I'll take it. No, never see me again. <laughs> obviously that's what happened. It was written in the letters. You can see it in the letters. That man, is there a big cover-up on that story? But anyway, I just put that out there in case somebody goes, oh, you're such an egotist and he thinks he's smarter than Einstein now. So like, no. Highly likely you are smarter than Einstein too. So what I've done is I've just unlocked your cities for saying, you know, going to people saying like, mm, I think I'm smarter than Einstein. And then you tell them this story. <laughs> and, and if they still give you flack, send them to me. <laughs> but anyway, I, I just uh, say you. So there you are. Right. Maybe yeah, the, Einstein uh, maybe also salvage this. Oh yeah, go ahead. Einstein also needed um, a lot of help in the mathematics from his friend Marcel Grossman, um, which is not to be confused with uh, with uh, Grossman, who um, in, helped to invent sometimes the geometric algebra that that gets you that one Maxwell's equation. That's Grossman algebra, so it's not the same guy, Grossman versus Grossman, but um, uh, the yeah, he he helped develop the the tensor calculus and stuff that 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 got Einstein was able to. Um... Oh no, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. The that was um, uh, yeah that that mathematics Einstein wouldn't have been even able to figure out. Uh, yeah, Einstein wasn't a very good mathematician. He's always trying to be saying like he was a genius mathematician at school and something. He's like, no, he wasn't. The uh, the description that Einstein gave of gravity in one of his books that I read of of the tides is um, is wrong. He, if if you take Einstein at his word for his explanation of gravity, then you'd only have one tide a day. It's like all the the bulge of the earth would be just towards the moon like an egg and it would go around like that. And so the fact that it's an ellipse with with two nodes and stuff is Einstein didn't understand that. In fact, Einstein was not very good at um, circular motion. But when, once I, he, you know, he kind of had a mental block there, but when, once I had that unlocked the key that he's not a genius, then it opened up all these insights that I could add. One of them is in now really on the manifesto that Einstein rejected the idea of the pole flip. He rejected the idea of the pole flip because he did some back of the envelope calculations. He said there aren't forces enough to, to cause us the thing. So he, uh, Hapgood, um, said like there's so much evidence from the historical side more than, you know, folk and religious side of, of the, the pole flip. And so Einstein bought into it, and then he he looked at it, and and he he said, yeah, I mean, I I like the idea. They Hacker just thought the crust displaced. He didn't know. He didn't thought it was even more of a stretch that the whole thing just flipped over. But then um, that that kind of uh, perturbation and uh, the fact that it was dynamically unstable in a dynamically uh, the Earth is always in a dynamically unstable regime. Then then uh, he. 
he just thought there wasn't enough energy to, to actually flip Earth. He didn't know about the Zanabekov effect. But I think if, if Einstein, imagine if Einstein had, somebody had told him about the Zanabakov effect. Shit, we'd be in a different world today. Because he would have had to write another letter, you know, going like, Dear Mr. Kennedy, <laughs> I hope you are enjoying your Cuban Missile Crisis, but I have a worse one. <laughs> you know? Uh, you would have had to write. Like, you would have had to write the Extinction Ardy Manifesto long ago. But anyway, that's a, a good time. But okay, so uh, just just chuck in in that. So yeah, just one of the the ways is Einstein said a lot of bollocks, and it's worth if you're a physicist in that, in that it's worth looking at. But, but as soon as I unlock this idea that Einstein's just he's a fraud, I mean. What he did, he defrauded the whole world. He could go to jail for that. And that's why Nineveh got the money. But the, um, the, uh, he's a giant swindler. But, the, but um, if, uh, well, the, once, once I had thought of that, it, it gave me the liberty to think of Einstein as like, to, to, to not take everything he, he said without a pinch of salt. And so he said like, the whole thing about, special re general relativity was the, he said, you know, imagine that you're in an elevator. Now, the, he's, by the way, Einstein's a complete plagiarist. This he stole from Galileo, right, without attribution. But it's called Galilean relativity. We call it Einsteinian relativity. It's Galileo's theory, it's not Einstein's. So, so Galileo realized that a guy walking on a ship Right, you can do any experiment on a moving boat, so going down a river, and since everything is in the same inertial frame, you won't be able to tell that you're moving down a river. Well, Einstein rubbed that out and said an elevator, <laughs> just to hide the fact that it was old-fashioned. And he said, you know, if if you're in an elevator falling towards Earth, you can't tell the difference between an accelerator force or gravity. And I immediately went, as soon as I heard that as a kid, I went, oh shit. If I put you in an elevator and I tell, I tell you, like, you know, you, you can have any instruments you like. You tell me if you're accelerating or you're in a gravitational field. All you have to do is get two pendulums down like that. If your gravitational field naturally goes towards a point. If you had two, say, planets or two Earths and two centers of gravity so that the, the pendulums were straight down, well, that would be a whole different dynamic. They would have to be, you know, the two things would have to be in orbit. They would, you know, they would immediately come together and you would see that in the things. You see, it, a gravitational field is not the equivalent to an accelerator field. All you, it is if you have one pendulum hanging down, but then you can't tell acceleration or, or that, uh, or, or gravitational field. But gravity always has to be at the point of a mass. So wherever the center of mass is, you can just have a little bit of distance between two points, even as much as you have in an elevator. And you should be able to detect that here's the, here's the elevator accelerating, both pendulums absolutely parallel. Here's them in a gravitational field. They'll have to point to the center of mass unless it's an infinite distance and then would be infinitely attenuated. So straight out, there's something wrong with this theory. <laughs> it's like you can in tell in an elevator, you can do an, easily do an experiment to prove whether you're in a gravitational field. And, and, and you see, and once you get onto that, now, now you can immediately sweep aside all this bullshit that people say, like, you know, all these, all these cranks that say things like, you know, well, space time is possible because Einstein proved it because you could have a wormhole in space and therefore you could, you know, because space was distorted, you could move through a little hole in the tooth. It's like crap. To actually do that, you would have to have the mass arranged in some kind of scaffolding or something like that in very exotic fashion. If you had a mass arranged with scaffolding, it's like, what's it made out of? See, you, you see, it, it's telling you something very special about the universe. It's, there isn't a force to keep a scaffolding in, you know, such a hugely massive bit of scaffolding. If you, if you make it out of planets or something, they're all moving together, squishing each other, colliding with each other. You, to have a rigid frame that holds, a, a, you know, a curved space-time so you can tunnel through is like 
that's not feasible. Now, you can say, oh, well, yeah, but theoretically, no, it's telling you something very fundamental. It's telling you that, like, what would you make that frame out of? If you made it out of metal, that the, all the bonds are chemical bonds. So the gravity would exceed the chemical bonds. You couldn't hold that shape. See, all these things, they're telling you something. They're telling you, you can't go faster than space. Uh, you can't go faster than the speed of light for another reason. You can't bend, you know, you can't bend space in that way to actually beat the speed of light that way too. It's because you wouldn't, you, practically you can't find the materials. Now that's not just an accident. It's because of the fundamentals of matter and force and stuff. And anyway, let's not go down there. I'm just trying to say that when, once you, you know, do a bit of statue toppling, it suddenly opens up a whole new vista on, <laughs> on discovery in the world. So it's like, we have to do this statue toppling. So getting back to, you know, this energy information thing is like, it's, I hear, hopefully I've just undone a blockage that you probably have in a, in a blockage in your head that Einstein's a genius. Now, hopefully if you listen to me, I just unblocked that. And now immediately, yeah, you can, you off to the races. You can do new theories of space time, and this and that and stuff. Now, it's just because I was talking here for a little bit. And so, you know, you, you understand that just like a valve, I've, I've taken, the, basically, Einstein was like the base on the valve. He was basically stopping the meter and the collector in people's heads. Basically, a boat anchor on science. <laughs> He's a break on science. He's a cop on science. So, 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 so everybody says, you know, oh, he, he wrote all these papers on special and general relativity and opened up these new doors. No, he shut down doors. About, the minute he did these fairly convincing arguments, then basically that's a cop, right? It's immediately closed vast illuminating lines of, of thought and research and stuff like that. So just with the inf so you know, all I've been doing is talking digitally to you here. You see, like, if, uh, even if I'm completely made up the story about Einstein, I could trick you into having a whole new breakthrough theory. And they, uh, so, but you see that I've, I've liberated you so that the mitter and the collector no longer has Einstein standing in the way and all his thinking and his ideas is the ghost of Einstein is kind of like the base on the, on the valve. So he's, he's like the base on the transistor, stopping the flow. And, and in essence, all these guys are to a certain extent. But okay, so now let's go back to developing this line of thought. Let's go back to what I said of like, you have this weighty tome, which I'm trying to convince you that a weight, lightweight tome, a book, you know, like say like, look at all the shit that went into the Bible. Okay. Um, it's just so much, let's just call it psychic content and energy. So it, you know, you've got to believe it was hard won. Okay. So just like Rothko, I said this morning, I asked him, you know, how long does it take you to paint a picture like that? You know, thinking, oh, what a fraud. It took you 15 minutes to do that. And he said, no, it took me 54 years to do that. And suddenly, oh, bing. <laughs> you see, see, that's what I mean by information content is, is, to get a sigil or a spell or something, it, it does, you can't do it in a day, right? It's not, see, if you just did random shit, pictures, say, say the extinction army symbol, right? So we invested it with uh, energy and thought and pulled some strings together and bring a bit of cosmology. And, you know, you I can expand all of those too. There's a wolf's angle, there's a theta cross, and, it's all these things. So when we pull the extinction ID symbol together, just borrowing shit from antiquity and some of all of those things, I want you to try and believe is people invested a lot of time and energy. Okay, so, okay, uh, I'm trying to break this idea that we have that there's metaphor and there's physical stuff. I say not so much. Think about, okay, think about another sigil like the swastika, right? Now, that's a hugely powerful symbol. And you say, yeah, it's metaphorically powerful. say, no, man. <laughs> look at the psychic energy invested in that symbol. Look look at the pain and how many people died for it. And you, you're saying, like, 
so what I'm trying to suggest to you is that, that if somebody came from an alien, you know, from an alien civilization, and you showed them this symbol, they they very they're not likely to say, "What the fuck's that?" They're liable to instantly, if they're highly receptive and they have a lot of ESP and stuff, and they're wired into the patterns of the universe, they're very likely to go, "Whoa, a swastika!" <laughs> and you'd be like. Oh, you know about this? And they say, yeah, you got to watch that. They're very likely to say something like that. And you say, well, how do you know that? You've never been to Earth before. And you say, no, that symbol's got a lot more vested in it than, than just uh, what you know in the history here. It says, like, it has a, has a history on our planet. <laughs> and you, you see, again, what I'm trying to uh, convince you of is, is a notion, like I mentioned this, like Phoebe, my dog. And the notion of a feather, she's she's been bred for birds, right? As a hunting dog for birds. But I knew from a puppy, I knew exactly what she's seen every day, like I looked through her own eyes. And then get, show her a feather, and she goes nuts. She knows it comes from a bird. And like I said, my family thought it was unremarkable. So they said, yeah, she's been bred for She's been bred for being, hunting birds. And I said, yeah, but birds. A feather's not a bird, right? So it means that somehow in training the dog to be absolutely berserk, nutty about just about hunting birds, they somehow just uh, trained into the dog's brain a feather. You have to go through this a little bit. So like, did it happen accidentally just because you know they're selecting these dogs for their hunting ability and breeding them and they're saying like and you know when the bird takes off a few of them drop the feathers and somewhere that's being bred in so yeah kind of kind of you're on the right track but i'm saying there's an even bigger leap and saying that if you're talking about flying things you know you, you've got hermanoptera bats and these things but a feather has evolved too for the around the the laws of physics so it's it's not such a stretch to say that it's an archetype that if if you have air of this density and you have flying things on some other planet and life on some other planet you shouldn't be too surprised if you pick up a feather and go do you have birds here and they say no they pterodactyl things but you say like it would be very surprising because life has got to come from DNA, right? It's, it's not, you don't have a big assortment of things it comes from. So then you say, once you're in the ballpark of DNA, you're restricted on what you can develop now and you can develop flying things, but you have to be in a, a certain temperature regime. You certainly have to be, and we rigid one too. And you have to be in a certain gravity regime and stuff. You, you don't have a lot of leeway in this Goldilocks area. And so you shouldn't be surprised that they would have oxygen or air or some hexafluoride, carbon hexafluoride, or some, some gases in the degree. And if you've got them, there would be roughly the density of air here. And so don't be as surprised if something's flying in it that it would develop a feather because it's efficient. So now you would say, okay, but it's kind of accidental. Say, no, the feather's bubbling up out of the basic... Um, possibilities in the universe, the physical possibilities that you can do with shit on the periodic table. And so you shouldn't be too surprised if the dog got, got its bred into its brain from another root. In other words, it's too, in other words, what I'm suggesting to you, there's a mathematics of flight that somewhere, or linguistics of flight, that somewhere includes feather. So the concept of feather is not just you know, a, an arbitrary item or an idealized item or something like that. I'm saying it's an archetype. And that you can get the dog just by breeding the dog one way for a fascination with birds. Don't be surprised that you also got its brain into a thing where it could recognize it spontaneously, recognize a feather, even though it's never shown one. And feathers, what's it got to do with a bird? It's not, it's not intuitive that a feather is related to a bird if you're talking about a selection algorithm. So you see where I'm going with this, that there's now, how do you get to a feather? You know, 
takes millions of years of evolution. You go back to the Cambrian era, I don't think you've got too many things with feathers on them. It's more like Jurassic. So, so it's like a certain amount of evolution and complexity has got to go down the line. It's like somebody's put in some effort. See, this is, this is why something is a little bit wrong when these transhumanists, and particularly people like Turing, Turing saying, like, in, uh, in the, that video, um, a very good one about the truth stream guys, they were talking about the cyberneticists, and, okay, Turing was not a cyberneticist. He was, he, uh, he was in the, um, the what's-name club, uh, the, the come on, the dining club there, but it, it was the crest club. No. Was it the, the crest um, club or the just a no, short the, name? No. Um, I can't oh, anyway, I can't remember. But anyway, he was um, he he was there. basically that was the Macy Foundation branch in Britain. Uh, they invited him to the Macy conference, but he couldn't go, and he couldn't tell them why he couldn't go, and that was because he was he was gay and he was found out to be gay. And so he was a security risk. He wasn't allowed to go to America, but he couldn't tell them, well, I'm a bum bandit and they think I'm a security risk. So they would assassinate me if I left England. <laughs> See what, what happened is he, he had too many state secrets and they were pet. You see at that time being gay was illegal. And if they, it, it was a, the black, you know, a black mailers charter so that, you could have got state secrets about him by just saying, you know, blackmailing him with you know, telling him that he's, you know, he's compromised. So there's got to develop state secrets. So, so, well, you, you, also, so you also had to, you also had to keep quite the fact that they had to, they had to shut down a lot of uh, German operations that he had decoded. So in order to, to, to not be discovered so that he had to be a complice of a lot of deaths. That would have been avoided, but they didn't want to 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 reveal that they, the German code had been broken. So they had to until the until the end of the war, they had to let go of an awful lot of lives. Now, even though he saved a lot, but he yeah. had that on his oh, shoulder. Oh no, there's so much. Oh no, I mean, basically, he's an insider in the dirtiest game you've ever seen. So there is a lot more than just the deaths. So it's like after the war, then Churchill ordered the the bomb to be completely destroyed it wasn't completely destroyed it's, they made a big song and dance about it. it was Churchill said no nothing bigger than half an inch should remain of it and it's like what a load of crap they had it in all the South American embassies they put it, the the, the MiG machine was used by all these third world governments until late into the 60s and so they they were reading it just like they were reading the Germans and they didn't want anybody to know so anyway this was a big deal in the Cold War and during it but he knew all the secrets like Edward and Edward was a Nazi. Edward was a traitor, and he, he Edward wanted to. Edward had a secret deal with Hitler that after Hitler had invaded Britain, the only thing standing in his way was the Battle of Britain, which didn't go too well because of radar. That um, that Edward was going to be, you know, George was going to be booted. Edward was going to be put back on the throne with with Simpson, and then they were going to have a little yay yay with. Uh, the fascists and the royals and the you know, it's like uh you can see why this is a dangerous story you can see why they whacked him so okay if you want to know what happened to alan turing whacked but the, the um the uh yeah so if you if you're interested in all that thread go and have a look at kim fulby and donald mcclain and stuff and one of the things they did was they sent people they rubbed out they rubbed out um, uh, what's his name? Uh, not Goering, Goebbels, not Goebbels, Goering, uh, Himmler. They assassinated Himmler. They they captured Himmler and then they sent a guy to rub him out because Himmler knew too much. But that's the power of the British royal family. They, Kim Philby and Donald McLean, were, they actually revealed that they were sent to recover all the documents about all this treason of <laughs> that now is under lock and key there's a d notice of a million years on it but but they um revealed in things like um spy catcher i think and stuff and all you know basically they they ratted on the on the royal family in a way that britain didn't notice um but they 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 said they went to, to the american occupation zone 
And, uh, you know, the, the documents were all held by the Americans, and the Americans wouldn't release them. So what I think it was Kim Philby, it was James Blunt, not James Blunt, Blunt or Philby. And they, anyway, they were there. Um, and they said, well, can we see the documents? And the, <laughs> the Americans brought them out, stuck them on a desk. And they, the guy was uh, said, like, okay, you can't take them, but you can read them. And while they were reading them, the guy got called out of the office. And they went, okay, that's it. They quickly grabbed all the papers and just legged it. <laughs> Americans were like, come back, you bastards. <laughs> they're like, oh, you know, oh, I've got the crown jewels under my arm. It's like, saved the, saved the royal family. And they got into a Jeep and legged it. That's how close the queen came from being <laughs> knocked off the throne. <laughs> anyway. I uh, just share all these stories with you. So, okay, but uh, let's get back to developing this idea of, um, you know, information energy. Um, so I kind of going there with it saying that, uh, you know, like if uh, you remember what I said, if they have what I was told about reverse engineered spaceships and how they worked with symbols on them and say, well, these aliens, or I would say us, <laughs> The feather in the in Phoebe's head is like we have all these mandalas. So they're basically the the alien symbols that I've I trolled people with and used here on the Sirius website and stuff, which I was told maybe reliably, maybe not, but these these were real. Is it what is basically if you these are probably according to my theory in your head. So they're taking out article, you know, stuff out of your head. That's where all these symbols come. That's where the swastika comes from, all of these things, right? So they, they, they symbols inside your head, the mandalas that unlock abilities that you, you have, in, but in your own head. So when they see them, you know, stamped on parts of a spaceship or something like that, and the spaceship self-assembles or the part suddenly integrates miraculously, rather, it's not don't think of it so much as physical meaning that you you unlocking the pilot's mental ability or the observer's mental ability to do this simple kinesis now what i was trying to emphasize in in this morning's meeting is that it's it's not a free lunch it's not harry potter you don't get to elevate the as using the example of how they failed tried and failed to elevate the pentagon with woo you know Timothy Leary and those guys. And it's like, you can't, you, you don't know, it, you really need a source of that kind of energy. And so I'm saying, you, there's no free lunch. You, you have to get the killer jewels from somewhere. You got to like eat, eat enough Wheaties till you've got the killer jewels to raise the Pentagon. Well, was, this you morning you, you were, to go back to what you were saying, because I, I mean, I'm a bit slow on those physics things. So the, the what you what you were saying is that the the law of physics cannot be ignored basically first of all and yeah, that's with why the caveat if we don't understand it yeah so as yeah. soon as you see you what we're dealing with here is false assumptions left and right so if you know it's an advantage not to know about physics because if you if you know about physics you probably left to a false assumption you're saying like oh so what you is saying is that we can't go anywhere past Boltzmann's equations, we, you know, Maxwell's absolutes. We can't say like, no, nah, I never said that. <laughs> Those guys had their description with its own limitations and it also will bind their cities. So the magician could have unlocked certain things, but he's also a victim of his own limitations and his own symbols. So you know, Maxwell's equation also limits Maxwell in a way. So you can say, you can say, ah, oh, you, but you, you know, you could, you could raise the Pentagon. You know, Hughes just limiting his cities uh, with this false notion that you can't do Harry Potter. And say, no, 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 you've gone too far. And that's what I was saying this morning. It's because the, the human brain is locked up with the, the capabilities as well. It's the same as the as I was saying, it's the law, God and the law of God is the same thing. So it's like putting it all together doesn't mean that Einstein or Newton or anybody captured the mind of God. It was just their guess with the corresponding limitations. 
but never get never get away from the fact that that there's no free lunch it all must work out in a good way of making them work out is with a mathematical description that's why Vance is so powerful it kept things like conservation of matter and energy kept things straight but you see then so then I'm saying so it gives you an idea of how to interpret Wu because the first thing you've got to say is <clears throat> the best interpretation is kind of like Occam's razor it's like the thing that would need the least energy so in a way Michael Sherman is right you've got to say that the the least violation of physical law and stuff in an incident so for example if you take that that movie where um Gold, no, what, what was the guy? Uh, Colstadt, the, the Australian journalist that, that has just done these amazing movies on Wu and UFOs. So he's got the story of this girl with two policemen on this base in Australia, American base in Australia, and they see this V shaped craft come down and, you know, all of this stuff. And so, okay, so, how, so now if you follow through, these, these are my advice for you know, cutting through the Wu. And getting through it so so okay what have you got you've got three people in a car the two gate guards and this visitor who's breaking the law which probably means she has heightened heightened psychic tension important and now they see out of this window this v-shaped craft and it comes low on the ground and stuff and so okay what's the simplest explanation well how much energy does it take to keep this mother big craft up there and say a lot so it's like okay so now you're really saying okay where's it coming from is it was it reverse engineered u.s technology so then it, was it petrochemical you know did it come out of oil barrels somewhere on a base is it going to fly back to the root base and refuel it's like you don't get zero point energy and no 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 there's no such thing so so the, the uh, so then you say well okay well, the least energy configuration that you can think of is you would say, well, it's the easiest thing is everybody's telekinetic. Everybody's telepathic, right? All these sympathetic effects. So say the brain is in point of criticality all the time. It's easy to get into sympathy. Is uh, Veritasium did a good, a good video on synchronization and the magic of harmony and synchronization. So I found this too uh, back in the glass furnace. When I started with the glass furnace, so this is a resonant chamber, right? So we're talking about electromagnetic effects in the gigahertz range. And and so um, I uh, basically, I, magnetrons to commercial magnetrons, they don't make them in all different shapes and sizes. They'll have like 915 megahertz and 2.5 gigahertz. And they, they're incredibly cheap. The 2.5 gigahertz one in your microwave oven costs under ten dollars, you know, in bulk. And so, so these, uh, you know, so so you know, you're talking something a very very cheap component that's just fucking godlike. Now, uh, to actually get power out of them, you, you actually have to build up arrays of them. And so. Uh, the conventional wisdom was you can't do that. You can't get a resonant chamber and just start chucking magnetrons and waveguides and stuff like that. And so, you know, I knew that and radar guys told me all that. They, they had all these theories that, no, they'll cancel each other out. The waves will come from this side and that side and cancel each other out. And all of these things, which they were just beliefs they had. Nobody, I said, like, has anybody tried it? Oh, yeah, Percy tried that. And it's like, so, like, and you go, like, and eventually, like so many of these things in science, they're just beliefs. It's somebody said once that perhaps it's like this. And then they got quoted as, you know, Percy said it's like this. And then before you know it, it's an iron law of physics that basically every engineer knows that, you know, that some bullshit. And then you yeah, the absolutely article of faith, a piece of religion. And you say, can you quote that? And like, well, it's not worth the bother. It's just, it's just like breathing air. Every engineer knows that. You say, like, can you find the actual paper? Oh, for Christ's sake. And then they go and look, and they go, you know, it just came out of there. <laughs> it's like, it's like, okay, good. <laughs> now let's go test that. So what I did was I put 
way I knew that this would be the first thing people would say is you can't scale this. And I think like, so the very first experiment I did, I made sure that I got the worst configuration imaginable, which is basically two waveguides, two transposed magnetrons facing each other. It's basically everybody would say, well, no, that they all they're gonna do is put heat into each other. You're gonna get reflective radiation in the heat of those magnetrons, they're just gonna burn each other out. Um, this is you know, I knew that, that that was a joke. I had a sneaky suspicion what was going to happen, and I was right. Is but is sure you have a resonant cavity like that. But here's something no new. They get into the motion. Just I'll post the video from Veritasium. It's how things synchronize and how you get these pendulums. It it was done by Van der Lubbe or something. No, one of one of these guys, but yeah, you know, it was done by these clockmasters that were developing pendulums. Who was it? Uh, I can't remember. But anyway, it was a guy who amazingly found that all these things synchronized. And there's a demonstration of how you can just get a little plank, put it on two Coke bottles. You put three, like, you put three metronomes and they miraculously start to, to synchronize. And the Derek on the Veritasium does quite a good job of explaining. It's, of course, you're doing maths here, so it's very different. You have two and three, and <laughs> where where it gets chaotic and where they cancel each other out is all stuff that blew Newton's mind away. But anyway, the you see what my bet was that just like the pendulums, the oscillation of the magnetrons would synchronize, and that's exactly what happened. So eventually, you got down to doing twelve and twenty-four in the worst configuration. People assume was the worst. It was no, it's like he got this big woo, woo resonant cavity, and so that was pretty freaking exciting. Now, think of that in terms of going back to this story of these two guards and this base in Australia and this girl seeing this craft. Now, like Penrose and all of these guys are saying, is like, you know, consciousness got something to do with quantum mechanics, and everybody says, oh, that bullshit. Quantum mechanics. Has got, you know, to set up a double split experiment or bells, check bells inequality, you have to do precisely aligned lasers and you have to dampen out all the vibration and even a truck going past ruins your experiment. And so it's like to have a lumpy, squishy mass like the human brain doing quantum is like, get out of here. This was in as recently as 2012. They were telling that to, I don't know, Smolin or, and, and, and um, and Penrose, just absolutely laughing him out of the room. I mean, cruel, cruel. And uh, and it's like, yeah, very soon after that, they found, nah, he is right. They have microtubules, there's quantum effects. That they found now that photosynthesis is, is utterly reliant on a quantum effect. So every leaf is doing bell inequality things and stuff. And it's like, they found all the squishy wetware full on quantum. And so, so okay, so if you got that thought in your head, then you've got three squishy quantum jellies. You say, yeah, well, come on, man. Is this such a leap that they're not being telepathic, that they, you know, they're acting like yeah. one brain, just like my resonance cavity? Yeah, it is. It is absolutely yeah. such a leap. Uh, you can't make that leap because what you uh, – it's it's – reasonable that there are quantum effects but there is no reason to say that quantum conscious consciousness arises out of that like there's quantum consciousness and this kind of thing that's that's no, just no, no 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 i i wasn't going that far i i'm just going as far as saying that the resonance it's just electromagnetic resonance so all i'm asking but is but what I'm you're doing is you're, you're doing an ex post facto like um you're, you're trying to rescue telepathy and these kinds of uh of classical things that people want to believe in by by trying to reach for some scientific uh, you know it, it's it's really a pseudoscience type of thing it's like you you if you want to do science you you set up the the falsifiable hypothesis and show how you can be proven wrong you're not going back yeah, from what, what you were i well, you see, this you see, this is you, this is you what use I was the saying. Word, that. You use the word resonance and telepathy. You're trying to work backwards to find it. You're not you're not doing science correctly here. 
Uh, no, but there is a, an opening to a science experiment. So what I'm I'm just doing a hypothesis, and then you could subject it to Popperian falsifiability. Not easy because there's an ethical consideration. Is is these people are um, sort of in heightened states, and so uh, you know you can't. There's an ethical problem. I mean, you, you can't just set this up in a lab. And then if you saw the what I was saying last weekend, you've got, you've got this this double bind that you're in, that if people are telekinetic, is the, the observer is never outside the experiment. And so if, if the observer doesn't believe in telekinesis, he's not going to see it because he's fucking it up. <laughs> so, yeah, you'd have to get more than, you know, you'd have to get a majority of people that b believed in it, and you have to get them in a near-death experience. And they would override the cop, which would be the skeptical scientist. That's an article of faith. It's not a hypothesis. You can't, um, you can't say no, that. But it's testable. It's testable. That's right? not. That's not testable. If you're saying mass delusion is possible, I agree with you. But if you're saying that you know you need everybody to be in the delusion to be able to prove the delusion exists, it's nonsense. You all you need to do is to make set up experiments that have already been done, where you put people, um, you know trying to do telekinesis, separate the information from them and show that they can't repeat the people who believe they have telekinetic powers, separate them and you'll, you'll get the, uh, you know, predict what the other person's going to say or whatever based on, um, based on some, you know, medium of thought transmitting between them and it, and they can't do it. Anybody, you no, claim no, anybody can do you're it. Missing, you're missing a I'll, crucial piece. They, they can't do it because the experimenters don't believe it. The experimenters are, are, are skeptics. That's bullshit, and you know it. No. <laughs> okay, so there's, there's one way to prove it to you, and that's basically is to unlock it in yourself. No. Uh, the, you, you, just, you just jumped the shark, man. That's nonsense. Yeah, well, the, this is what I'm saying. is basically that I'm going to get to the point where I jumped the shark. And <laughs> this is it. But this is where the cop stepped in. See, you, you are... You are See, what, where is this thought coming? You can see there's energy in this thought. I can hear it in your voice. Where well, is that energy coming from? Why, uh, why is it so important that, that it must be that way? Why is it so important? I can important see you're invested in we... it. You, you really, without any real proof or evidence, you, you have an emotional argument against what I'm saying. Uh, you just bullshit it again, because I just gave a... Uh... Uh, I just cited a, an experiment that has been done repeatedly and has always failed to prove your point. Because the experimenter doesn't believe in it, because the experimenter also has it, genetic power. Find, if you find experimenters who believe in that, like set it up and show me that it, that it works. But don't claim that you know I can't. the answer. I can't because you also have telekinesis. So what you're power. saying... What you're loads saying, of people set this up and do it. You can just do it with a bit of DMT. It, loads of kids uh, take drugs and, you know, you talk to any kids, they'll tell you how they've, uh, you know, had telepathic experiences with people when they have DMT and, and a few drugs. Yeah, I, I've, I've been, I lived in San Francisco. I know plenty of those people and they're full of shit. They, they, they say they woke up and, and uh, like they, they had a, uh, they found that they were in a matrix and in the matrix and like um, they, they think that the drugs are the pathway to get to the true reality and this kind of thing. They're, they're, you're, it's, it's just a simple mistake of thinking that your brain doesn't, it, it isn't mediating reality for you and that you have tapped into the real thing. You know, I would say that was what your argument was. You, you, what are these people doing? Are they hallucinating? They, they are, uh, yeah, I guess it's hallucinating of some sort. So then you're saying there's a reality. These people have just lost connection with them. No, I'm saying that they are Im imposing their own nature upon reality and thinking that that's what it is. Yeah, but isn't that what a scientist is doing with an experiment? No, usually it's trying to get get the human element out of it, so that you yeah. Can... But you see, this is a modern thing that comes with the Enlightenment. Is you see, uh, physicists are continually baffled at why it takes so long for people to f discover empiricism, and Bacon comes along and starts trying out some of the shit that that 
Aristotle said, and Galileo starts dropping two balls and says, you know, the bigger one doesn't fall fast as like Aristotle was wrong. And they continually go, why didn't people try these out? And I'll tell you why. If you go back to John Dee and you go back to Edward Kelly and stuff, it's like they knew you couldn't separate yourself from the experiment. They said basically they would have said, if you go and try dropping two balls, they'd say, well, it depends on what you believe. The outcome of the experiment, you, you, what we started in this enlightenment was we said we could stand aloof and observe this Newtonian billiard ball extravaganza and say like, no, because we go, we go through all of this. We eventually get to Einstein and Niels Bohr's argument. You see, Einstein is the cop arguing with Niels Bohr. Then, then Niels Bohr, you know, is arguing for Wu in effect. And so then, you know, and then we get to quantum weirdness. And then that opens the door for, for people like Penrose and stuff to invoke quantum weirdness to explain. But you see, we've got back to Edward Kelly and John Dee. It's like now the observer is crucial in quantum mechanics. And you say, yeah, so we did a long circuit through the Enlightenment and got back to woo. So no, first of all, the, the common interpretation of the observer being important in quantum physics is commonly misunderstood. In the same way energy is commonly misunderstood by the pseudoscientists, right? It's when, when you, it's, it's all about measurement. If you were, think about it in terms of, of waves on the ocean. Like if you have, um, if you have a, a, a peak in a wave, like a, say a wavelet, you can identify its location. Right, because you can measure it there, um, but uh, you you can't identify its frequency because it's not a constant frequency. It's like got a a weird um, like it's sharp in the middle and falls off at the edges. So it it makes sense. You can't measure um, you can't measure its its frequency or its speed. Right, um, you can just measure where it is. And then, but if you have a long waveform like a sine wave. You can measure its frequency, but not where it is. Like, where's the middle of the wave? Like, what's the position of it? It's it, um, and it's based on the the how you, the, the the ways of measuring it have an influence on what which of those you can see. But it's not about consciousness or that there is an observer with with you know. It's it's simply like there's a there's an effect of measuring that's hard to extract out. That does not give you free license to say you can use telepathy. Uh, not directly, but okay, so let's take it one step at a time. So I would modify what you said by saying you can't get two bits of information out of the wave because you have to collapse the wave packet. You have to collapse the wave to get that energy out. Well, you have to take the energy out of the wave. So you have to destroy the wave. So you know, otherwise you could double dip and do two samples. You could just find the peak of the wave, then quickly get the frequency by just you know, waiting a bit. <laughs> so the reason why you can't get two bits of information out is because you have to take the energy out. You have to collapse the wave packet. That's the problem. Well, this is, if telepathy would be possible, the, um, you know, there's all these kinds of, of uh, attempts to, you know, in science fiction, they'll say, oh, uh, you can use the quantum entanglement between two things to, to communicate over long distances because that's instantaneous and whatever. And, um, but every, every bit of physics says that's impossible. Like you cannot actually transmit information doing that. You, you can destroy the information on one side and have it go to the other, but you can't like solve the communication problem that way. Um, specifically, you can't. So it's uh, even if you were trying to go through um, quantum to, to have this, this communication at a distance without, um, without having the you know, speed of light limiting it or having, um, uh, you know, go, uh, appealing to the, some of the same science fiction stuff. Like you, you essentially have, um, it's just from a misunderstanding of the physics yeah, I, I mean, I'll agree there, but let me say what I think the misunderstanding is. And so you, you definitely can't transmit information by, um, you know, quantum tunneling or, or basically 
some quantum effect over over distance. But I think that that's uh, the reason for that is is the problem of locality. And so, in essence, the the two points where you're taking the measurement, according to light or a photon, is they essentially in the same place because of uh, Lorentz contraction. So they they essentially right in the same spot. They they actually are a, imagine them like a point dimension that has no distance between them. So you can't send information to an overlapping or coupled point without dimensions in space, which in effect, that's the way light sees it. So for example, when a photon's coming from the sun, it takes eight minutes to get here. Now, the uh, if you were riding on the back of the photon, like Milliver thought of it, or supposedly Einstein, was then basically the, the photon would say, it took me zero, took me no time at all to get from the sun to the earth. And more so because of Lorentz con contraction, we'd say that the sun is right butted up against the earth, according to that photon. So, you know, there's some weirdness that says, why is it for us that it seems to take eight seconds or eight minutes? And so it's, it's basically, you're, you're saying in effect that, you know, the photon cannot transmit energy because it's like, the photon hasn't done anything. There's no action according to the light, until according to the, the bit of energy that left the sun and hit the earth. According to that, it says, no, nah, nothing happened. We say, yeah, like a distant observer, uh, says that, no, that took a long time to travel <laughs> that distance. And uh, yeah, there's a big effect. So do you see that those, you, you, you putting chalk and cheese together. I never made any claims for being able to communicate instantly over distances. You made that assumption that that's part of telepathy. All I'm saying with telepathy is you have resonance. So if, if I have one uh, resonant chamber, it will, uh, through harmonic effects and stuff, start resonance. Resonance, and resonance, resonance. in what? Resonance in what? Electromagnetic resonance. So say something like, you don't even have to go quantum. I mean, you just in the dendrites. but in, in the microtubules, just maybe not go to the microtubules because they're so famous for being quantum. But I'm just saying, just take regular, this is why I introduced the fact that the, the, the microwave resonance chamber, because these things achieve sympathetic resonance. So all I'm asking of you is you have a bit of electromagnetic wetware, and it's just saying sympathetic resonance, you know, it's basically even acoustic resonance in another closely adjacent bit of work. That's all. I'm not talking quantum me mechanical things. You are adding all these layers. I'm, I, I never said it. So, um, but these, they should be measurable and they are to some degree, like you can do MRIs, you can do, you can do um, uh, deep, deep brain stimulation um, with magnetic resonance and these kind of things. But to, to think that that was, how communication evolved in our brains. I think it's that the fields are too weak to be able to. Ah, uh, okay, now, okay, now this is a good thought. This is a good thought. Now, do you remember when I said right back in the beginning that to get all these psychotronic effects, you, you, these are weak signals, but two things here. They, because they cross canceling, people's brains are not aligned and their thinking is not aligned. All these concepts are not aligned. The wiring in effect is self-defeating. So in general, people might have uh, quite a strong electrical effect, but uh, say you can prove it with something like people have a, a bigger electrical effect when they're having an epileptic fit. But what I'm saying is you have to take them to an extreme uh, state. So they're almost in a state of panic. They have to be in a near death experience and, uh, they have to have these kind of neurotransmitters flowing like DMT and stuff to get these effects. So for, let me give you another example then. So, so there's, uh, and then I'll, I'll try to go straight to Wu to show you that it's, you're adding all these extraneous things. So you're leaping here and here and here, and you're not listening. And I never said all these, but then listen that you, Weinstein is talking to you. I can hear all these voices in your head and like put those all out and just listen to what Hugh's telling you. So, so, okay, listen to this story. So, okay, uh, in Corfu, there's this um, 
palace. So it's called the Kellyan Palace, and it's a very psychically charged place. Now, I'll go back to what I was trying to convince you of is that there's such a thing as in, in something loosely called something like in, information energy content. And so then maybe you could be a little more woo and say it's you know psychically charged or it's like this. There's something that people could tell that like this is not an ordinary place. This some shit has gone down here. And so and now this place is definitely one of these places. And uh, so at um, yeah, the palace is uh, she's called Lizzie or Sissy, but she's the Empress of Austria, and it was her place. Um, they're in Corfu, and I, I went there frequently last year because <laughs> there's no one there. And so they're beautiful gardens, and but this place has a lot of history. It's just dripping with history, and it, you walk through the door, and it kind of like hits you in the face. You've got to be your real Michael Shermer if you're not kind of spooked the minute you go into this place. Um, so the history of it is that uh, Lizzie was uh, Empress of Austria, the Kaiser Wilhelm, um, yeah, okay, to give you an idea of the psychic content of the Achillean Palace was Kaiser Wilhelm, he went there to secretly plan all, you know, World War I and the battle for World War I. And so, so I mean, you can't, you've got to be really, really hard-nosed to say you can't, you know, the, the walls don't resonate with some of the shit that's going to come down in World War I. I mean, that that's, come on, there's nobody well, yeah. that, that, that bone dry. Uh, so that's so, okay. So, wait, wait, hang on, hang on. You just you just tried to smuggle in a, a an assumption there. So the yeah. uh, I think that there are um, you know experiences that people have in certain places, but I think those are just like art or things like that. Like you you have a brain that you know that resonates with you in some way, but that's not in the place. That's in your brain. That you got it. That's my whole premise. You just agreed with it. Resonance in the brain is what I said. You added all the Weinstein bullshit. No, I'm I'm saying that there, there the place doesn't have that resonance. No, you just said you just said that the resonance is in the brain, but it has a relationship to the place. There are places no. where they initiate that resonance, right? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the the place has no resonance. Resonance. We are imposing upon nature our own nature and misinterpreting it. I, I think yes. that when we have a reaction to yes. something, we think that's a part of the nature that's there. That's not, um, and that it's like there's like a special place there that that has that. It's it's not. Yes. It's we we like like you say earlier about how we feel relaxed when we hear birdsong and things like this. There's there are natural modes in our brain that where we feel okay this is a safe place we feel comfortable like gardens and these kinds of things where you know uh our, we will naturally feel more uh relaxed because it's it's not a you know a place of high danger or something like that but um it it's i'm not when you're you're talking about imbuing symbols with with psychic energy and this kind of thing that psychic energy is is in the mass delusion rather than in the symbol so what you were saying about the alien uh, coming down and saying, oh, I know what that, that symbol is, that's, that's where I'm saying you're wrong. You're, you're infusing your mass delusion with the, with the, um, with the, the symbol itself having this, this uh, energy medium. And that's, that's where, um, and I'm not saying that all mass delusions are necessarily um, uh, devoid of any information content, there are archetypes and things like that that have a natural pathway to get there, like the bird song, right? And so there is meaning there, but to to say that that meaning is somehow real outside of the human experience is wrong. No, but rewind. That's exactly what I've been saying. That's my whole thesis from last Sunday to this Sunday is exactly what you just said. Okay, uh, do you get it now? It's do you mean what, 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 you, what you were saying about in the Eastern meeting last week in the morning when you um, started to talk about the UFO as a symptom 
and that it was you know and that it we, it was infused by a certain psychic energy in certain you know is that what you're talking about are you referring to this yeah 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 so i'm i'm confused here because i just contradicted what you just said and then you said no, that you it's... didn't you, d you no, didn't I... you see this is the thing you, the, you're the getting symbol, all the spun up about something right. that is entirely in your own head is basically okay. I'm, I'm saying exactly the same that you're let saying me pin you down. Let, me pin you down to what I'm, let me pin you down to what i'm referring to because i think you you sophie just made a clarification and that wasn't what i was speaking referring to i was referring to the swastika comment you made earlier so in that comment, I was contradicting you. Okay, okay, good, okay. So now will you grant me this? That just like you can go to the Kellyan Palace, right, and get influenced, same way as with the bird song. why is the swastika not like the bird song? Because the... the um, Okay, so that's a very interesting question. There are, um, so often um, if you have, th there's a bit of difference in terms of our natural, um, it's kind of a nature and nurture question here. One is um, there are areas of our, uh, our experience um, that are, um, genetic in a way, like where, where you'd, you'd maybe in the dog's case of the feather, like that there's certain resonances there or you see uh, us having a bias against snakes and things like that. Those are somewhat genetic. Um, but then there's also historical and mimetic spread of influence through our understanding of history, our understanding of, of uh, our, our innate biases or resonance with different kinds of um, uh, uh, historical precedent so you'll see in in religions there'll be a lot of different um copy pasting of of different fragments of stories across them all even if there's not a connection because of the archetypes and things like that so that there are certain things that are similar in human beings that allow them to resonate um uh and if they don't then they don't you know become of mention because people just don't pay attention to them okay wait stop uh, now what's different from that and telepathy um, the medium of, of, of transmission. So, well, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Okay. What's the medium of transition for an archetype? Trans, transmission, sorry. Transmission, sorry. Transmission yeah. of an archetype. So the medium of transmission of an archetype is usually, um, mimetic or, or genetics similarity. It's not, um, Okay, but uh, what, what's the mechanism? What's the mechanism? Uh, it would be embryology, um, various. Uh, no, no, that you said that was a you, that was part of the nature thing. You said that basically the nurture thing is mimetic, and then that doesn't come from the biology. Well, partly it it it, it has a scaffolding in the, in the biology, like. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll go on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it. I think but, that but then what but then, where I don't that go comes with to it, the floor. So I, I think that what when so if you're dealing with uh, I agree with the idea of archetypes in terms of that there are you know patterns in human experience that can be alluded to that we that are like anchor points of uh, where where we can have good guesses that we share experience between each other. Um, however, I don't go as far as you that's does and say that there's a way. That's, no, that's uh, telepathy. It's telepathy. It's, it's basically tele from distance and pathe thought. We have distant thoughts. You're having distant thoughts now through the yeah. medium of digital. Yeah, I, I, I'll grant you that, but that's that's kind of a redefinition. Okay, of so why is this telepathy? Why, why, when we're talking now, is this not telepathy? So the um, this is this is a uh, telepathy mediated by you know um, di distance communication. If you're saying it's just dis distance, okay. But all I have to do now to, to win you over to my argument 
is I just have to prove to you that there are other mediums of communication other than electronics and fiber objects. Yeah. Um, that's that's true, and I think that you. Um, okay, well, we, we're in good. We don't don't screw it up now. We're in a good place. But go on. Yeah. So my my point is that there um, is no biological um, uh, evidence for a um, a radio in our brains that that is a primary means of communication, even if it's in extreme circumstances. It's more likely that you're looking at noise or, or error in your in your in how you um, measure those events. Um, because they're highly subjective events, than um, than thinking that we have the actual wetware where that that communication is possible. So you could have this in uh, uh, whatever your synchronicity telephone thing um, concept. There's there's shared mimetic basis, and there's like just looking at someone's fashion, you can know a lot about them, and you can get a lot of communication. There's just knowing how someone spatial expressions work, like. This is how you bootstrap a human being, right? It's this this empathy and like knowing what people are thinking, because um, that's how the language gets trans transmitted into into a kid. Like they'll they'll be able to read the facial expressions. So if you take a P Mr. Potato Head and you like screw up its faces and you show it to to a baby that can't speak or do much of anything, they'll start crying and you show them a well faced one and it'll be like happy. Like we we can do these experiments that we know that we can have that we have um, these these kind of like footholds and handholds for our our bias as um, thinking things right but um, and that that helps us to bootstrap but there's um, there there is a common thought of like I wish I had the superpowers to be able to communicate with uh, like for example dead relatives you have a copy of your dead relative in your head right you can speak to them in your head because you can imagine what anyone would have said in in that um just like you can imagine what your friend's gonna say if you if you propose something like that that's part of why our brains are so big is because we need to model social interaction to be able to predict what someone else will think about what we do and so, yes, you can speak to the dead and these kind of things. The, the only thing is you're not actually speaking to the dead. You're speaking to the, to the symbol of the dead person that you represent in your head. So there's nothing magic going on. There's no, um, you know, psychic energies. There's nothing like that. It's just a part of your brain and some parts of your brain are outside of your consciousness. But that doesn't mean there's, there's woo involved. Okay, but... Yes, yes, and yes, a thousand times. This is my thesis. You're you're reading back my thesis from ye last Sunday to me. Okay, <laughs> you overlaid it with there's no woo involved. And I'm like, that's a bit of a non sequitur. Okay, so let me let me so you let's take it break it down. You accept? I absolutely agree with you that you can talk to a dead relative. You're not talking to a poltergeist. It's in your head. It's absolutely in your head. So a, a dead person, right, can be memorialized and you can talk to it and you can have two people saying, you know, I just knew that old dead Jake would have said that at that point. You say, were you thinking that? I knew that too. I could almost hear his voice. And then you, basically the, you could easily, easily have a simultaneous thought and you say, well, it's just uh, rose like that. So I say, why is the swastika any different from dead Jake? Well, uh, the um, probably because there's there needs to be experience with the um, the no, sorry, that doesn't. Some noise you back just here. Said it can be genetic. You just said that it it can be uh, evolved, right? Can be uh, can be native. Um, that there are cases like that, yeah. Um, but I think in the case of um, no, wait, wait, cases like what? Like like the bird song and stuff like that. But I, I think in the case of like say writing systems, 
If you yeah, have but why birdsong? Can we replace birdsong with swastika? <laughs> Would it kill you to do that? Because <laughs> why um, can't a swastika if, if evoke a Jungian archetype? So, like, okay, take it like this. If you, if you look at some of the kids that insist they're having um, a, t a mutual telepathic experience and they're on the synchronicity. So, the, the, by the way, the, the, um, the synchronicity uh, telephony, uh, telephone is, um, it comes from Timothy Leary and the, the guys came out of it because they said, you know, when you both get on the same level and you both go on the same trip in the same way then you share all these thoughts like you're saying yeah you get into like a mimetic bond now you don't have to completely lose your shit over this they're very normally they're very simple things if you look at people saying now having a ayahuasca trip and stuff they will tell you that everybody has the same thing they have the they see the snake the snake isn't named you, you know the shaman if you're not on a ayahuasca trip will tell you why because you just mentioned like we, we highly evolved. We evolved in Africa. I, I shit scared of snakes. Africans hate snakes. We have snake. Somewhere there's an archetype for snake in us. You, you just show a kid. I mean, a very young baby yeah, but, will, this might is... play with a snake. But I get to a certain age, it'll f lose its shit when it sees a snake. Right? Yeah, so there's, there's actually... There's a snake um, in us, optic... right? There's an archetype. Yeah, the, 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 and it's in your, your amygdala. So your optic nerve actually passes through yeah, yeah, your amygdala first before it gets to your occipital lobe. So, um, and that's because you need to react to snakes faster than um, than your normal cognitive ability. So there's this um, subcon like beneath your consciousness level of um, of like response to various stimuli from the amygdala, and it just goes straight into emotions, like bam like fear right away if you see um, yeah, okay. a, a coiled rope no, or something. No, yeah, okay, so no problem with this. But now, okay, so what, can, will you allow me this? That on my five brain led, what lays, you're basically the amygdala is part of the reptilian brain. And you just say like reptilian brains do reptiles. It's all basically evolved into us. So now you shouldn't be too surprised then when people go on an ayahuasca trip and they really screwed over like top layers and the, the policeman layers, the cop in your alien cortex, that yeah, the, all these archetypes come out. It's the same drugs, same stimulus on the, on the evolved neural architecture that puts it into snake mode. It's basically, it's just to do with the, the chemical concoction inside our ayahuasca. So the, it's just not, you know, all that woo. Then if you go on DMT, then people see the machine elves. You say, well, yeah, because uh, it's like Oliver Sacks. They found um, all these modules, that there's a module in your brain that sees cartoons. That people people literally get a lesion that stops the that part of the brain being suppressed. And literally, Walt Disney cartoons, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and so it's saying like, and yes, Swastikas, there is also a thing. So it's just part of it. So the you know the fact that so, we have all this same symbology and this mimetic architecture in our heads, it's it's pretty much a lot of it is hardwired. And then the hardwired stuff leans heavily on the cultural stuff. So when you get a swastika, it's it's a it's the mixture of a lot of things. One of them is the mimetic history and stuff like that. But it's it's also the, it's unlocking things in our visual plane. It's unlocking things in each one of the the layers in our brain. That's how they work. That's what. Yeah, that's that's, what's going on. that's that's true for a lot of things. Um, but you, it's very difficult to know which ones they are. So, for example, there's a lot of yes, events. exactly. That's why they can't. That's what I told you. That's why they can't reverse. That's what I was told about the the the, the spaces is they can't tell. They know that the symbols work. They can't figure out the language. It's like they've got the the meme. They know it works on them. They know that this is not woo. They they know that it is making you hallucinate. So okay, so. Just give me a, a spell here while I go back to this thing that I posted and on this guy um, and, and this diagram. So this this guy, Albert Budden, what, what he's saying in effect is is that um, uh, that he gives the example of a CCT 
CCTV camera and he says when people are having these paranormal, he's, he's very unwoo. He's trying to get the most rational, uh, skeptical, um, low impact quotidian, very prosaic explanations. And so, so he's saying it's kind of like your perception is like a CCTV camera. And what these encounters do, especially people that are really charged up, often people that are epileptic or being hit by lightning or something in their past, they're very kind of like open or open circuit <laughs> in the head. And so what uh, it does is it kind of superimposes an image like, you know, the old trope in the movies where they put this false image in front of the CCTV camera. So then, uh, you know, you, you can hide a lot of shit behind it, but also you could actually animate the false image in front of the camera and saying that's what people are doing. And you say, yeah, I mean, to me, all he's described is, yeah, you, you can say it another way. Is, yeah, the person's going on a trip. They're substituting an acid trip reality on what they, what other people would perceive outside. So this is, a, this is not very woo, but it's it's kind of exactly what you said. It's, you know, basically it's, it's a superimposed, illusion on top of the the reality and so yeah that's that's what an acid trip is no nobody says any different well a lot of a lot of people in san francisco say it's say different like that it's actually a um a real um yeah yeah like but don't bat them the... down don't don't but yeah i think you're too quick to bat them down you see i think the cop in you is strong and 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 it, too strong so don't buy them down. If you go and, and ask them exactly what it is, you say, like, what did you communicate? Did you communicate, you know, your ideas on Dostoevsky? Did you communicate uh, Swiss bank, uh, bank numbers? No, it's very, very simple stuff. It's very simple stuff that they're communicating. You see, everybody makes these leaps or these kind of, that's why I have no time for these people like Weinstein. They're so intellectualizing they miss, miss the obvious. Well, it's, 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 if there's any, um, you know, uh, over, uh, overt, like, uh, extra cop behavior, it's, um, because there's so many leaps that are made by, uh, by folks that, that try to, um, you know, believe in things because they want them to be true rather than because there's evidence for them. So, um, and, uh, a lot of, a lot of psychopath scammers that that take advantage of that weakness. I and totally so, agree with you there, Ryan. That is my resistance, and I don't know—is it? The, I don't know if it's the cop there, because we have been faced with so much wacky thing in the in my generation too. Uh, and you've you've been you've lived in San Francisco, and you get a kind of reverse reaction to to these sort of things. And uh, yeah, exactly. I understand where you're coming from. Wait, like, hang hang on here, I. I absolutely agree with with what you're saying, but you see, it's one group is making too many wild leaps, and one group is 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 too inhibitory and too much like the cop. So it basically, uh, okay, I would propose this for for um, a rough model of of consciousness. Really, if you take like the split brain. I would say that it might be that consciousness as we kind of know it as a bodied experience only comes about in a split brain. And what, what is happening is sort of McGillcrest way is your right brain is making these unwarranted leaps because of what McGillcrest says. It's evolved to make snap judgments on whether it's a snake or stuff like that. Then the right hemisphere, and this is proven with the Gazanaga and Sperry's experiments, it's uh, policing that and saying, you know, like, oh, calm down. This, this, is, this is a more logical explanation, more reductionist. And so that works on the human scale and also works on the scale of society. So when you talk to these guys, they overstimulate it in the right brain and they make these unwarranted leaps. Then, then Ryan comes along and makes an unwarranted cop. <laughs> you see, it's, uh, they're both too extreme. That that the you will you will see amazing effects, but only if you can scale gap back the cop and let the right hemisphere take a few leaps. Well, I I don't really think it's a an issue with the cop. I think uh, if I 
No, because you're the cop. Have you ever met a cop that has an issue with a cop? I'd like to finish my point. Um, I, I, if if what you're gonna arrest me, (laughs) hit me with a truncheon. If if you had been, uh, so it's a problem with me not listening rather than a problem with what I was saying. Because if if you were saying what I, I thought you were saying. It would have been relevant what I had said, but I, I just listened poorly and I apologize. But it's um, there. There are. Uh, it's what you were saying sounded so similar to what people have said before that um, that I and I, I admit that, that you jumped maybe, on that you jumped on that you jumped on right. Yeah. Um, Voila! <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But jumping on it Just is the stop correct jumping response. Jumping on people and scale back because yeah, basically it's too reactive in, on both sides. That's why both sides are fucking each other up. It's okay, basically, but... you're seeing exactly what happens in the divided brain on even if in the you know Dems against Republicans and GOP and stuff. You're seeing all this stuff, but you see to to actually get somewhere in all of this is is you have to emerge from this third point of view. You can never get to the third point of view where you're saying, like, I'm the cop, <laughs> it's like, I'm shutting that down. And the other person saying, you're too much of a cop, we need liberation. Your, it's basically your, your analogy, this unfolding on a planetary scale. The, the analogy of the cop is, uh, it's, it's very um, subtly misleading. Um, and because there are, um, uh, it, it makes it seem like it's always negative. Um, and no, no. Their... Okay, so let me let me say an imagery then. Okay, so yeah, it's 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 a loose metaphor, but let's tighten it up. So it's the inhibitory circuits in your brain. So what what most of what your alien cortex is doing is inhibitory. The vast majority of it is shut. What's going across the corpus callosum in the undivided brain is is basically these stop messages. They're saying like you know the. The inhibitory, they, they're triggering inhibitory neurons. Right? Yeah, and, and, but we need to be careful that uh, we're, we're using our terms correctly because um, when we say inhibitory, it means something different than we mean when we usually use the word uh, with relation to cops. So, for example, in your, um, uh, your basal ganglia, you, you may be, uh, if you're preparing to hit a baseball, you may be playing through the, the neuron firings that would fire your muscles to swing at the baseball over and over and over again. And there's an inhibitory uh, complex that is preventing you from actually hurting someone but what, as you're thinking about what you're about to do, right? So that's not the same as the cop um, when, when it's like, I'm gonna put you in, in restraints. It's, it, that carries a lot of um, connotations with it that we need to we need to be specific about so we know that we're not we're not conflating stuff like we like we see no, so no, often. I, like I, no, I would suggest that you, you be more liberal and conflate the two. See what what the cop is doing uh, by you know pepper spraying a, a kid or something. It's it's basically he he is it is an extension of his brain. His his brain you know he's he, he's in that job because he does a good job of that on himself. And so, yeah, he's, he, he would do that internal behavior. So it's basically, okay, take a pretend it's the primate brain. So he sees the primate brain, brain playing up. He's awfully good at shutting and inhibiting his own primate brain. So by extension, he's good at whacking a kid who's also playing up like so, a monkey. So you're, this is, this is the I point I was on, making. I, that... I would stick on the Ryan in saying that you have to, the cop is not completely, uh, it's like the alien cortex, like, there is a role. There is a role. There's a mastering of of the cop. That, but you can't, you can't completely deny the role of the cop either. And also, you know, what you were saying just now no is is actually, um, you know, you, you were making the very leap that I was hoping we wouldn't, which is, uh, we're we're talking about uh, when you're talking inhibitory, uh, it's usually at a uh, a neurotransmitter level or a, or a neuron, neuronal yeah, but level. I'm saying, not, not above a above that. Let's so just stress. extend that. So why is it different? Why, why? So if you could actually look at the connectome and all of the, the firings in the cop's brain, 
Why, why do you think you're in a completely different paradigm and you're executing so, an entirely different program to the one way he would inhibit his own brain? I'll, I mean, just think I'll of the mirror explain. neurons. Yeah? I'll explain why it's different. So if, uh, and mirror neurons are, are also something that ha are of dubious uh, um, scientific validity, but um, the, the uh, uh, think about it this way. If you were to assign emotional like content to the zero and the one in binary, or like to the black and the white in, in young or whatever like that. And you say and, and that- And I would, by the way, I would heavily do that. Yeah, but go on. Um, that's inappropriate you, 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 because- You honestly think there's no emotional content to black or white? Do you want I've, me to use the N word and see, you want to see how charged black and white is? I'm saying that when you're building, when you're trying to understand the structure of a system, it's, it's uh, like, like a bit of computer software, there's a bunch of zeros in there and they're not, you know, racially charged. <laughs> there's no racially charged content in there or whatever you're, you're trying to bring into this. It's, there's the- Google the, algorithm? Google algorithm? Hey, no? Uh, I'm, Gorillas? You, no? You, you know that's not what I'm talking about. It, kind what, of, what but, I'm, but, but what I'm careful. talking you're, about- you're, you're getting too rational. No, I'm I'm making making uh making sure we're not smuggling in thoughts that aren't a part of I'm, I'm what you're intending. I'm deliberately trying to smuggle in thoughts. That you see, the, this is what I said in the. I, I can see you didn't listen to the last the one last Sunday, but the the, the Eastern Ex Extension I'm reading. I say, I'm deliberately smuggling in thoughts. That's what I'm trying to do, and you're trying to jump on me, <laughs> saying like saying that's the cop. I'm 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 trying to uh, loosen no, it up. What I'm trying to do is answer why there's a um, a difference between the the inhibitory and the the um, non-inhibitory circuits in your brain. If you if you just blanket statement think that there's um, you know that inhibitory responses are all cop style, then then that's like saying that all um, all zero. No, I never said that. Program never are, said that. No, no, no. You, yeah. I never said that. Who, but, I know. Did I ever say that that all inhibitory I, responses I'm are not, cop responses? No, I said the cop responses are inhibitory. I'm. Uh, I. That may not be true either. So, um, the in the way that the brain functions, if we want to understand how the way the brain functions, a lot of things that seem like they would be inhibitory are actually excitatory, and yeah. vice versa. And it doesn't and contradict so, what I'm saying. Then. But it it does cut off a whole path of intellectual pursuit if you if you shut it down and say like there are yeah, so there's that's, function that's, in the brain absolutely but you are you that is exactly what you're trying to do you are actively trying to shut down a whole intellectual area of pursuit no i'm trying to by being that. the cop no you just did that with the kids that, that was a whole area of intellectual pursuit that you shut down by rubbishing what the experience the kids were having. You mean the, the drug experiences? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, what I'm, I'm not trying to shut down that those experiences have been meaningful or valid for, for them in their lives. I'm trying to shut down that they have, um, some, Legitimacy. Uh, some right. you're, you're saying they're illegitimate. That, I'm saying that they are not so it, physical laws. That you you can't derive physical laws like that. Um, it, 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 well, hang on, what what? But uh, okay, you're really trying to say that they're not legit, right? No, I'm trying to say that, like those experiences and things. You you you. I think they are legitimate in terms of consciousness. But what I, I don't think that they do is they that what you can draw conclusions from that and say that there's electromagnetic radiation resonance at the physical level. Uh, no, but you can't really deny it either. Okay, so you could so, you could easily set up a falsifiable experiment and prove that that those that resonance didn't happen. Yes, and I'm saying that, that that that's viable. The the ethical concerns because I'm saying you were saying that they're too weak, and they are generally too weak. But but uh, I'm saying that you can get in a state of panic and stuff where these um, 
these effects are really strong. So strong enough to affect radios and stuff, and that's what I was saying in the in last Sunday. So, I mean, I, I came to these things because I through that route. Because when I was in the Air Force, we found it basically cautiously say that when you get in these like really, you know, psychically charged and really extreme in extremists, um, that's when these things start happening. I'm saying a, a very obvious thing is um what the this the sky um is saying it's kind of kind of like the opposite he's he's saying the albert button guy he's saying well you know there are all these things around which like electromagnetic uh, uh emitters like cell phone towers and high tension power cables and i say yes but he's missing the fact that any receiver is also a transmitter given enough energy so he's missing the fact that we can also mess with, uh, you know, microwave towers and things like that. And so, you know, we can also get sympathetic resonance and things like that in all of these things, just like the Bertussian video shows you how you can basically get resonance in all these effects. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, think, you're, I, th I think you're just flat wrong about the, um, the ability of in an in extreme uh emotional state so, wait, have you ever radios. been in an extreme have you ever been in an extreme so basically I, i've been I'm a, a pilot and the um an air traffic controller and all so what we're trying to explain here is what the f-19 hornet pilots and that see and all these effects pilots see and so it's yeah. it's it, you know it's it's like so so where how do you explain the f-19 pilots and the fact that you have fighter controllers and all this Stuff that the guys uh, seeing that gets recorded on radar scopes and it gets recorded by gun cameras and FLIR cameras and so it's like, where's that all coming from in your thesis? Well, I I don't think that um, if I uh, if I I think a viable answer to that is I don't know. Um, and to not jump to the yeah, but I'm trying to explain. But you you'll never know if you shut everything down that you hear automatically. Yeah, but you'll you'll know something wrong less often. <laughs> so um, if you don't know where they don't uh, follow. Wait, wait. What would what so would be if wrong you, in, if you in jump? Space? If you if you try to say, well, it can't have been. Um, apologies. Uh, so if it's. Uh, I'd rather not say, be honest and say I don't know than to, um, than to claim that I do know and that it's, you know, some psychic energy thing. Uh, when it's, it's, there, there isn't enough no, evidence no, but, for that. But, but you see, I'm not making a strong claim. I'm just saying that this works for me because of what I've seen. And I said in the, I think you really have to look at the last Sunday's uh, thing, but I'm, I'm saying that if you walk through my sandals and had my experiences, this is the conclusion you come to. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's so much true for me versus true for other people. If, if uh, no, there are I. experiences that people have, but... Yeah, um, neither do I. That's why I'm having trouble with you having such a, a, a blocking effect on this, what I'm trying to explain to you. You see, I'm trying to give you bits of information of things that you've never experienced. You've never been in the military. You've never seen these things. So one well, of the ways I, you I can break they're... through people is actually showing them. So if you, if so, so in other words, I've shown lots of people that are real skeptics like you break through. Then they're in a completely different world because they have to reinterpret all the stuff they've laboriously built up over the listening to Weinstein screw up the head for years and years. But you, you only have to see it once, and you and that's it. You've blown away everything you're talking about now. You just have to. You see, you ha you're not talking from experience, and I am. Well, that's that's an argument from authority, and one. Uh, no, it's an argument, argument from. I'm not claiming authority over you. That the cop in you is saying I'm claiming authority, saying I'm not. I'm claiming experience you don't but have. I've I've had. It's not authority. Uh, I've had deeply spiritual experiences before. Like, yeah, but we're not talking spiritual experiences. We're talking about flying an F-19 and seeing a tic tac, you know, basically respond to your thoughts and then splash in the ocean. Yeah, I I think that um, correlation doesn't imply causation there necessarily, but um, having the uh, 
Wait, 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 stop. What correlation with what causation of what? You said you, said you had certain thoughts and then something fell into the ocean. I, I mean, I, I have to admit, I haven't No, they, the, last the tic-tac one. response, if you're in the videos of the cult, cult trade thing that started much of this off, is basically they're releasing this footage and they're saying this is real. They're saying, sorry, Michael Shermer, sorry, all the cop that everybody had, all these people that dismiss Wu. You're going to have to get over that because the, the government just came out and said, Woo's real and these things are real. So you don't you no longer have the option to rubbish correlation and causation and stuff is basically what you're saying, argument from authority, apologies, but I'm claiming the authority of the, the US Navy to say, look, those days are over. You can't out and you know unwoo yourself so easily. They yeah, they're saying I can. The, I mean, thing, the, the fact just, with the with the, the pilots are all real. So you it's fact now. Just and now because... you have to explain it. You no, can't. No, no, you no, can't no. Keep on saying it no, never no, no. happened. Absolutely not. I don't. It, just because some government bureaucrats say it's fact doesn't mean it's fact. Just like, just because some police departments use psychics to to try to solve their crimes or that MK Ultra like tried to into, induce telepathic weapons and some kind of things. These are government okay. bureaucrats. Okay. Are, are you casting? Doing. Are you casting doubt on the fam now famous? F-19 Hornet pictures. Um, are you I, saying they're fabricated? What what kind of woo are you trying to go for? No, I'm I'm not. Uh, I just don't pay it much attention because I think it's it's not. Uh, the cop in it, you won't let you. The cop in you won't let you pay attention to it, and that's I'll, also what I, I was saying. I will. I, I will pay attention to it if you if you say it that, that way, and I'll I'll come back with my conclusions later. But that the. the um, uh, I think that for a long, uh, government has had a long history of, uh, you know, of pushing these uh, pseudoscience narratives as a as a false flag or f as a, you know, screen. Yes, to, yes. So, so, okay, but, okay so, so, so now we're having a problem with with a, a lack of a lack of communication, a lack of uh, so. But, so where we came in, we really have a deficit here. We should probably save ourselves a lot of time and trouble by just going over the last Sunday's thing. But where we came in on this is that I put in the, the, the manifesto this little book, bit, paragraph, where I tried to downplay all of this and just essentially unwoo it and say, look, coming close to the flipping, you're going to see a whole lot of weird shit. I'm saying just ignore it. It's it's geophysical effects and stuff like that. I suddenly realized because again, more and more comeback and what people are saying and stuff is that like I'm not going to get away that easy. I'm going to have to basically go a little bit deeper, and you you can't just brush it off. So if I if so, this is my fear is that if you don't know what I'm telling you now, if you if you don't like loosen up and start to take my advice on how to interpret this stuff, you're going to be blindsided because some weird, weird shit. I got a strong feeling that the government is going to pull some very, very weird shit. Now, people like you that are absolute skeptics, you're going to be knocked for a six because you, you, you're you going to have to say all these little green men arriving on the White House lawn. And it's like, how are you going to interpret this stuff? It's basically you, you, your world is going to be shattered. So I'm trying to say like, I'm trying to give you an out of to how to interpret this. And I'm saying it's it's all in your head. It's in these other people's heads. It's in the government's head. There's, there, I do not believe all the evidence is against the fact that they're extraterrestrials and little green men in space. But I know for a fact that the government, the various factions in the government that are looking at these um, fast walkers and that, they're tracking them. And a lot of, I know, the guys in, think that it's coming from the Pleiades. And so the so basically I'm saying this stuff is coming at you fast. So if you if you ignore this, you, you're gonna have to do a lot of revision study in an afternoon when you see amazing shit on the television. So yeah I, I I think that that's um that's laudable a laudable goal. I think that for um for a lot of people that will be really tough to disambiguate. Um, and yeah, but you, I'm talking about you, not other people. How are you going to disambiguate it when you see flying saucers on the White House lawn or people being beamed up from the Pentagon and stuff? 
because you see this is the this is the danger is like see i'm saying that this stuff is entirely a psychic phenomenon these f15 pilot f19 pilots and stuff i've seen it i've seen it happen these guys are working themselves into a collective illusion so i'm repeating myself yeah. from last week but i'm saying that like this is much stronger than every all the skeptics and the, the rational enlightenment humanists have have you know taught themselves to believe they're going to be a little bit shocked i think when they, with what they're going to see next there's a big danger of it yeah and so, I, and so I, I i'm very aware that i'm vulnerable to collective illusion and i'm very no uh, no no i don't think you are i don't think you you are and that's why you're going to be blindsided i mean when have you ever had a collective illusion can you describe it personally like like uh I had um, collective illusions of um, just uh, I mean, in person, aura, not, not collective illusions that you once believed in Jesus. I mean, where you were standing on the Pentagon lawn and you had the collective illusion of a UFO coming down, like that. Nothing to that degree, but... That's I, the problem. There you go. So you don't have experience on this stuff, do you? Okay, so yeah, I know that so it just exists the, as an as an experience people can have. Like it, it's yeah, but what, how are you going to react when it happens to you? <laughs> it's all abstract. It's all in your alien cortex. It's all an intellectual I, exercise. This is what I'm, I'm not, saying. The danger is it's going to leap out of your left brain and confront you right on the lawn. Well, uh, I would probably just discount my my experience, like as right. Like, okay, so, so so okay. This I take this hypothetical, uh, a, a huge you know huge big spaceship comes down. You have close encounters of the third kind, and it's appearing on Fox News, and all the news channels, and everybody's losing their shit. Now what do you do? Do you say, "Well, I'm hallucinating, I'm hallucinating Fox News, hallucinating what the Pentagon's telling you, and hallucinating what Joe Biden is saying from the podium"? How does this work out for you? Oh, um, in that hypothetical, it would be, um, I'd probably take the same approach that I take to Fox News or any news source typically, which is just to, you know, take it with a grain of salt until, um, until we have, uh, like, there's so much lies on there. I just don't, I don't. Okay. Okay. So then you take, take it a bit further. Now the guys are telling you, okay, so. Now everybody's lost their shit. Every Weinstein is doing mere culpas about how he was wrong about Little Green Man, and Joe Rogan is is saying, you know, is analyzing this and trying to do sense making of what's going on and stuff. And then the thing says basically, oh, Earth was a huge experiment. The experiment is over, and all you guys are about to be graduated. We're going to start taking you up into spaceships. And then basically we're going to take you off to paradise and the Pleiades or whatever. Now what? Did you get on board? Or would you go like, mm, I'm taking all this with a pinch of salt? Yeah, that's that's hard to say. I'm not sure. Um, it It's a... Uh, well, well, you better decide because I'm putting this well within the realm of possibility these days. Things are starting to get really whack. Really weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I think I can decide at the time, um, but it's... Uh, no, okay. Now, this is, this is what I do not believe, <laughs> is that you'll make the right decision at the time unless you start listening to me and my theories on what's going on. Right. Do you want to uh, explain why? I think most people would get on the freaking spaceship. And what I'm... Maybe you didn't read the manifesto. All I'm trying to convince you is, now this is dangerous because I'm not on certain ground. I, I, I can really do you a big disservice if I'm completely wrong and there are aliens out there and, and they are about to take everybody off to heaven. I could have just done, done you a really disservice and cost you your life in heaven or whatever wherever they're going to take you. If, if you believe me, you would say no. You wouldn't dream of, of going along with this. 
But that's, I think it's going to be difficult if everybody's going through a mass collective illusion. Right? And we, I think yeah, we no, I, I'm the most of my approach to these kinds of things is to do something different um, than what the collective does. I am a pretty contrarian that's, person. That's pretty much all I'm saying is if, 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 if that's your response and you're good enough to not, to not back out on that, then that's all I'm trying to achieve. Right. So then it's fine with me if you don't believe in woo or anything. Other thing. But you see, I, I'm telling people what I know about woo stuff with the aim of convincing them not to get swept up in, in woo stuff. But you see, you're going to struggle unless you, you know what it is, or at least you have as good a theory as I've got about what it is. But if you have the common or garden theories, they're about to be blown out the water. So I, I don't imagine a lot of people are going to hold on to their mojo because all the shit that they thought they knew is going to go out with it. And I'm trying to give you a little bit more bedrock on, on how to interpret all this stuff. So you're a little bit more hardened and <laughs> not skeptical, but you understand it in a different way so that you wouldn't go along with it. So I'm trying to get you out of the danger of going along with a very dangerous collective illusion, in my view. It might, it might be as real as little green men landing on the lawn in, in the White House, or it might be a metaphor or some some kind of um, you know well, variation at, on that. at this at this point the the main narratives ha are, have such a bad score on the scoreboard of of being not scams um, that you know it it take a lot for me to just wholeheartedly embrace um, a mainstream well, narrative. No, the danger but, is the danger is everything fits together. The danger is, you know, when the aliens land, then the whole story, everything fits together. Oh, they they spin a story about, you know, Jesus was an alien and, you know, this, they can explain all the Bible to you perfectly. All the Islamic people are all on board. Everybody's, you know, you know united in this um, revelation. And, you know, what? All the talking heads would be saying like, oh, I figured this out before, you know, because it was obvious that um, God was an alien and uh, the angels were metaphors for what we're seeing now. And, you know, the Pope will be going and saying, yeah, this is all predicted in Revelation. And you know, shit all, like all of that's just alien cortex, like b backward explanation, like coming from the, the conclusion to like, it's just it, it's just retconning the. The, the reasons. Yeah, but the, that's the what the alien cortex does. Right? The, alien, yeah. the alien cortex and the Gazanega and Sperry experience, experiments, they show that pretty much <laughs> the majority of the time, the alien cortex is just confabulating bullshit. It's just confabulating a story that in effect leaves itself in charge. And that's what these guys will do. <laughs> We're confronted with a complete blowing out of everything they thought they knew. The alien cortex will be working overtime to try and backfill, and it'll do a tremendously good story. I guarantee. I totally agree with that. I think it's, um, you know, judging by how much I've had to overturn, like it has been really painful already, um, and uh, that's just, you know, there's going to be more <laughs> coming that I need to overturn. But um, but with with people who are who are going to have to come to that without um, without that slow burn of preparation. It's going to be really, really painful. I don't know if this is it. the thing. This is what I'm trying to do now. So you use the turn of like a complete overturn. I'm saying talking a complete overturn. I'm saying that the overturn of the globe, the, the, you know, reversal of the geographic polar axis is, is, is the physical reality, but the other, you know, the, psychological and emotional realities will be just as big a flip and um yeah that's uh um that's a complete transformation i think might be coming <laughs> might be coming in a way i think and basically i'm making the case that i think things are about to get kind of biblical kind of epochal and uh, a lot of threads seem to be 
coming together down that path. So what I'm trying to do is say, like, unless you, you have a slow burn run up to, you know, you, sorry, the best I can do is Hugh's version of the world. And so this is Hugh giving you a slow burn of what I think is going to go down. And if it doesn't, ah, good luck. I mean, live in Klaus Schwab's uh, communist utopia or whatever. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, it, I'm saying if it pans out like a thing, then this is your preparation. And I don't think you're going to do very well. No one is going to do very well if all of the stuff is sprung on them. They're going to have to make too much of a leap too quickly. And I think a lot of people are just going to commit suicide. They'll, see, there are a lot of easy ways of preserving your worldview. <laughs> One of them is, is to kill yourself so you don't have to do the adapt adaptation to the new reality. And uh, that will be the, the vast majority of people. And just think in terms of Marshall Applewhite and the Heaven's Gate guys and... You know, they're taking all these signals that Comet Haley Bob comes streaming along. Um, you know, they, the guys are kind of boxed in by their own thought processes and their own stories they're telling, their own belief system, or really Marshall Applewhite's. And, uh, you know, there's only one thing they can really do at that juncture, and that's basically go and top themselves. <laughs> because, I mean, if... If they don't, if all their philosophy of life comes together in the Haley Bob comment, and you know, and if then you say like, well, um, Haley Bob comment goes breezing past, nothing happened, there were no spaceships in its wake, nothing like that. So what are you? You're a bunch of dickheads in San Diego, following a complete arsehead with a complete wackhead philosophy. You can do that which is ruins your whole life if, if your whole life is that cult. Or you can just top yourself and go with the story <laughs> to its conclusion. Most people will conclude the story. It's kind of built into our architecture, our neural <laughs> architecture. It's the, it's the path of least resistance, right? It's to just, just go out with your, with your philosophy. And uh, so this is what I saw in South Africa. It's like, Rather, yeah, it seemed trivial to me to make the change into the new South Africa and to most healthy people. But to a lot of people that were invested in a worldview, they would rather shoot themselves and their families in the suicide pact than reorganize all their thinking in a new way. They just didn't have the energy, didn't have it in them to, to do it. And I fear that if we're going through a massive psychological and physical transformation of the planet, a lot of people won't have the strength to go through with it. They will opt out. And so some, in some ways, getting on the, getting on the spaceship is, an, is a, a version. It's just a catch, portmanteau, catch-all concept for just committing suicide. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Well, great. Well, the, we better stop on there, <laughs> on that thing. But um, yeah. Uh, well, how about this, Ryan? Will, will you keep me straight on the straight and narrow? Because I, I made the. Let, let's do some ground rules here. So, the, so we need some rules. And so, as you said, you can't go beyond. You can't violate reason. So I was saying in this morning's uh, Eastern meeting, is. Uh, stuff where Gary was going. So G Gary and, and you are kind of like mirror images, more like Gary's right brain, making the, easily making these leaps that you on, think are wa unwarranted and you, you would shut them down for being uh, you know, unreasonable and illogical. So um, I'm saying that we, we definitely don't want to violate reason and logic. And that's why I was saying like I hate Harry Potter and that because for me it's just three hours of inconsistent logic and violations of physics that are just nauseating. <laughs> it's just, it's, um, it's, it makes me sick in the stomach, actually, all that stuff. I should, I should uh, kind of make a uh, bit of a background that I, um, I was very much more of a Gary um, when I was younger. So I, I believed in psychics and, 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 auras and magic of crystals and all these things um, more than I believed in 
physical reality. Um, and so it's not like, I'm not coming from a place of uh, no empathy there. I like, I've been, I've been that, like, I know that um, what it feels like and, and, and had it be not just part of my identity, but my, my deep, um, you know, experience of reality. So it's um, uh, having come from that, it, it changes my perspective to be a little softer um, on, on that. But it's also in some ways it makes it harsher because it's, it's, I needed that extra energy to, to get free of it. So that's, but did, so did you see. feel that you got burnt in the experience? Is it a pain reaction to going back there? Um, some of it, because I, I got fooled by some charlatans. Um, so, yeah, and, and it, I, I see the path of, like, once you smuggle in some, some ideas of psychics or telepathy or this kind of thing, then, like, a lot of... Uh, uh, once you suspend that logic, and it gets Harry Potter real fast. And no, but but you you mustn't you mustn't allow that. You mustn't suspend reason and stuff. So if we ever violate off logic and reason, then we've got to do the hard work of like tilling the thing till we can make it make sense. So so we can't lie to ourselves or violate reason or anything like that. Um, so, but here's you see this is where I'm coming from. I've seen so much weird shit. I've, I've gone out seeking weird shit. And when you seek weird shit, you find it, you find it real quick. Um, and so uh, it basically it's, it's left me with a huge quandary because I've done this my whole life and I've seen and experienced all this weird shit. I guess I better volunteer some <laughs> of the weird shit to give you a flavor of it. <laughs> um, but, but uh, you know, I've, it, it leaves me uh, in a difficult place because the easiest thing you could do, which is what I think most people do, is they just say, yeah, I went through a psychotic experience and I hallucinated all this weird shit and uh, it was just a phase and I'm better now. And I say, like, I would love to be able to do that, except it doesn't work for the experiences. And, you know, I'm lying because I've shown other people. I've seen collective things I've been... <laughs> I've been introduced to all of this stuff formally in the cult that I was in and stuff. And so it's like that simple, op simple way of getting out of jail free is like, it's not accessible to me because I just seen too much shit. And it's, um, and so I've, ha I've been forced into figuring out in detail what's, what's going on. So, so, okay. The, do you guys want to go, or or sh sh should I tell you? <laughs> I'm gonna lose people if I tell them this story, but I think I kind of got to volunteer what I'm kind of talking about. Uh, I'll I'll completely freak you out, Ryan. Should I should I hold back? I'm uh, I'm I'm okay to hear it. Okay, let me just start with a little soft one, and let's say what I'm saying with the the um. A Killian Palace where, where Lizzie live, lived and stuff. So I took my daughter there and um, I'll do a soft version for you there. And so um, you immediately when you go in there, you can feel those places massively psych psychically charged. And, um, uh, you know, it's got all these personal artifacts from the Kaiser and all these bits and pieces. So we, you're fitting in bits. Of, if you went there, Brian, you would you'd be fascinated because you're fitting, fitting in bits and pieces of history and you think, oh my God, you're kidding, that fits there. <laughs> so, so assembling a lot of loose ends on bits and fragments from history and stuff. So you're getting all of this thing. Now, there's um, Lizzie herself, they call her Sissy. Um, she's, um, uh, she left there in, nine, the last time she was there was in 1914. So they show you this big mirror um, this huge mirror that was in a boudoir and it has a massive crack down it. Now the story, I have no trouble believing this because I've seen worse. And Jung and Lawrence von Apost and stuff is also comes out with this. And this guy, um, 
the uh, you know that I just posted here this uh, Albert Button guy he 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 tries to explain stuff away by conventional electromagnetic activity kind of uh, you know kind of demystify it um, and that's very worthy I think that's very worthy but <clears throat> because I think there is really a physical there is a psychotronic and um, psychoelectric effect on these things. But what, what happened, the story is that <coughs> Lizzie had, you know, basically the First World War, I think, was starting. She had, it, it, she absolutely loved that place, that palace. And um, <coughs> um, when she left, uh, she, she was, nobody was sure whether she would ever be able, <coughs> able to come back because it's in Corfu, right? <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, so she said that when, as she was leaving the house, as the story goes, um, she, she was in a really distraught state, um, and not, not knowing whether she could ever come back to the place she loved more than anything. And then, um, the mirror cracked. Um, and then she said, when the mirror cracked, she had no doubt that she had done it. Um, she'd, and she said, I knew when that mirror cracked that I would never come back. She, she went to Geneva and she got shot by an anarchist. Sorry, Lizzie. It's the price of progress, I guess. But um, that the, I have no trouble uh, finding a physical explanation for a mirror like that because it's, it's silvered and it's backed and she's full of psychic energy and I know about glass and all seen lot of stuff about glass. I have no trouble thinking that she could crack a mirror because of a state of distress, of, of emotional distress. And um, actually, I can tell you a less woo story that's, that's pretty close on those lines. I just remembered a story. Um, and I'll offer this one up because <laughs> I will lose <laughs> far fewer friends telling this story than the one I was going to mention, which is really out there. Okay. Um, when, and funny enough, uh, my sister's also called Lizzie. She died um, in 2015. No, uh, 2017. So, um, I, you know, I was sailing uh, with her son, my nephew. And uh, I knew that she had cancer and stuff, and she she was hiding it from everybody. Um, but it was a continual source of arguments for 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 me. So it was a very emotionally charged time for my nephew and and I. Um, I had to go to the UK, um, actually to Cardiff, funny enough, um, and. It was just at the point um, where the doctor said, you know, she's, she hasn't got long. And I, I got hold of one guy and I said, look, what are we talking here? Like, don't bullshit me. We've got to book plane tickets and that. I said, like, is it days, hours, weeks? And he said, that's probably like a week. So I said, okay, I'm going to put, uh, we we just got to Mahon. We sailed, we got to Mahon um, in the Balearics. Um, so I, I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to put my nephew on a flight straight away to Cape Town where she was. And uh, I said, you know, I'm not taking the risk that um, we sail any further and he misses seeing his mom in the last day. So it just so happened I had to go to Cardiff. So we both flew to Barcelona. Um, then I got on a plane to Cardiff. He got on a, um, the flight to South Africa, they only have one a day. Um, and so um, when we parted and I got on my plane to Cardiff, I knew I was making a mistake. And I, I knew that I was like, I said, you know, I'll do my business meeting. I said, it's only a few days. And then then I'll get on a plane to South Africa. And so, um, but I knew that I was making a huge mistake. When I said goodbye to my nephew, I could feel this the sky lowering on me. <laughs> it was like this cloud. And I thought, fuck it, you're making a huge mistake. You should just cancel this business meeting and just, just go get on the plane and with 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 my nephew. And and uh 
but I, I didn't because it was important. There was a lot riding on it and stuff. So I got on the plane. When, so and the, the, Here's the weird thing. The plane got all the way onto final approach to Cardiff. And the fucking, the, they said, we're turning around, we're going back to Barcelona. And they said, like, why? What's wrong? <laughs> they said, the, the front wind, windscreen of the cockpit is cracked. And I said, okay, I knew it. I, said, <laughs> I just felt like I did it. <laughs> and it was like the weirdest thing. We, we're on final approach to Cardiff. And they overshot, turned around, went to Barcelona. I was like, why didn't they land? They said, I don't know. Everybody was freaking out on the flight. There were people screaming and kids. <laughs> it was pandemonium. But I couldn't help feeling that, <laughs> that I cracked that window by the fact that I was just, you know, I just felt that emotional state. When when I to cut a long story short, I got uh, I got on a flight to South Africa, but my sister died mm -hmm. while I was flying. Um, but anyway, I, I just share that that kind of thing <laughs> happens to me all the time, so much that I it's you know ask members of my family <laughs> and they say, "Yep, <laughs> that's what he does." <laughs> so. Any, anyway, I just share that you, with you the kind of thing that you can say, well, you know, that kind of thing, you know, is weird or unexplainable, but like if it happens all the time and there's always those things, you, you can't rationalize it away, right? You, I, I don't have that option. I just see too, <laughs> too much of it. And so I'm just leaving you with that bit of woo story anyway my, my life kind of goes like that and uh, when i got to cape town holy boy there's a whole story in that week <laughs> just just to give you an idea of what my life's like when when i got to to south africa that she basically she my sister is she called was called liz looked very like liz so she was a dead ringer for Princess Di. Even so much that, you know, Africans in the street would say, shout, hey, Princess Di, and stuff as she walked down the street. She looked really, really like Princess Di. And then, um, uh, but she was a cult leader <laughs> with, with this other guy. Um, and so she got herself into a terribly bad situation because she, she clearly had cancer. And, but it was like a faith healing cult. And so she was helping all these people with their cancer and stuff like that. And, you know, actually people were saying, oh, she's miraculous. She made people go into remission and stuff. But, but I could see she was, everybody was sucking her dry, you know. Everybody just take, take, take from her. She's one of these givers, you know. And so everybody take from her. And so I could see that she had cancer and she was dying. But the, the, you know, anyway, at her funeral was all her cult members, like 300 people or something. And uh, they made a big mistake because uh, her partner, who pretty much killed her from neglect and the fact that he wouldn't allow her to go to get conventional medicine in a hospital and stuff, like that, he made a big cock up and he said, he said, uh, Hugh, would you like to come and say anything? And I said, actually, I would. <laughs> and I went and got on the stage. And you got to talk to some of the family members that were there. <laughs> to cut a long story short, I, I got, I didn't get very far into what I had to say. And I had all these people, 300 people, that were immediately going, Om, Om, and the more I spoke, the more they would shout louder. And they just, so I basically got owned out. My, you know, the rest of my family was there. They said you got owned out of existence, <laughs> but they they shouted me down <laughs> uh, because they didn't most passive hear aggressive prayer ever. Yeah, it was. It was, but you see, I was just trying to impart a little bit of truth, and they knew what I was saying. You see, you see, they were very guilty. Because they, when my sister died, then they suddenly realized that everybody had neglected her and they'd all been just sucking her dry and financially and spiritually, emotionally, in every freaking way. She, she was just had 300 people just sucking out of her. 
and and um, you know, I didn't mean them any ill feeling or something, but uh, uh, they it just going anywhere near that. Uh, they all knew, <laughs> they all knew. and and so they uh, that was the the cop. The cop shut me down with. Um. <laughs> Anyway, the whole reason I tell you the story is is um, just um, to tell you about the window on the plane breaking. I mean, how do I incorporate that into Skeptics magazine? <laughs> it's like... So, all right. Anybody want to say anything? Yeah, that's an amazing story. I mean, it goes to show that, you know, like the mind and the world are not separate processes. It's all one process. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't have to go too far off, off, off the reservation from what Ryan is saying. It's like, you know, basically all I, all I'm claiming is that you have um, an, at least enough telekinetic ability or psychotronic ability to to break a glass. It's not a big ask <laughs> as a as a physical effect from from what's going on in your head. Yeah, I think moods can be communicated without um without words as well like when i was volunteering at that wolf sanctuary there's this um i was closer with this wolf named patches and one day i was in a bad mood and i walked by her enclosure and she wouldn't go near me for a week and i didn't know what the fuck was going on and so i figured out like the a week and a half after that i felt a little bit better and then she was coming back up and being friendly again but she sensed my mood and went clear to the back corner of the pen and would not come near me <laughs> Yeah, the same with me. There's a, that's the biggest cities and stuff that, that I've got is like, is with animals. And so, yeah, I, I tried to get rid of all of that stuff, but I still struggle. I still struggle with dogs on the street and stuff here. They they, they pick up from a long way off. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's hard. I have no idea how to pack that in because I don't want to scare all the animals away. <laughs> Yeah. 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 But yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I I hope I can get you to believe that you know by not by just believing me. Um, I hope I can get you to a point where you can actually see it for yourself, so you, you don't rely on me. <laughs> you know, spook yourself, and that that's a big breakthrough. If you if you can actually you know spook yourself and uh, you that's quite transformative <laughs> yeah yeah there's there's a couple more instances i had so when i was in boot camp in the air force they give you this book of all this shit you have to memorize and it's really interesting because um in my free time i doodled animals all over this book and my entire time in the uh boot camp my book was never inspected but everyone else's was and if they found that i would have been my ass would have been grass <laughs> so it's like I kind of no, wonder really... if I have like some kind of guardian angel watching over me or something, because my ass would have been grass if they inspected my book. <laughs> hey, no, I did something similar when I was at school. It's funny, but not not woo. It was just cunning. Is that we had uh, science notes and stuff for the last two years of of high school, and you know everybody's book was getting thick and thick with science notes, and you had to have them checked, and you did all your homework in it and stuff, and. For two years, I never did anything. I think I had one page filled in. It was kind of like a standing joke. <laughs> and the only way I got, I, I never got the, each day the, the teacher would come around, but she always came around in the same route. And we had these lab benches, all these kids sitting in lab benches with, you know, pipettes and scientific equipment on. And what I'd do is I would wait until she was halfway around the room, then I would crawl under the desk to the other side of the room, pop up, say, hi, guys, I'm just here to make sure ma'am doesn't see my notes, and I'll show them, like, see, fuck all. They didn't know whether it was like, I, they thought, like, uh, he was just taking the piss. He's probably got a book filled with shit <laughs> twice the size of ours somewhere. He's just having a bit of a joke on us. He said, no, got to the end of the science thing, and, like, not, not a page. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> I never That's got That's pretty good. Got and they were, man, alive. I would have been expelled if I caught you doing that. Yeah, I think. Anyway, was... I got away with that for two years on a daily basis. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. 
Yeah, I think mine was more like um, when I doodled like all these wild animals over my book, mine was trying to make myself bleed red instead of bleeding blue, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, okay, that's enough woo for one day. There's a lot of psychic energy. <laughs> so, like, okay, should we just pause and just, and the whole point of pausing is to just, like, give all of this stuff up. And so you don't want to cling to it or get vested in it too much um so part of the way of just making progress and stuff is just to just leave all of this behind <laughs> until it, you know it'll crop up again if necessary but otherwise i think it's really valuable to just let everything go so it's like so i'm saying that let's just pause close our eyes and not get too passive aggressive with the ohms just stir the phosphines and try and get yourself into a state that you would be from like hearing birdsong or any of those other stimuluses. Om Paramatmane Nama. Well, thank you, everybody. Was that long? Yes. Yep, three hours. Yeah, thank you for those stories. That was very fascinating and interesting. I uh, almost told you one that would get me laughed right out of court, but luckily I thought of another one. <laughs> I, I won't laugh at you. I'll laugh with you. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's not so funny, the other one. It's basically, uh, here's the spoiler. The men in black are real. I had a lot of trouble with the men in black me. <laughs> But I'll leave that for another day. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Ciao. Take care. Bye.